very much. Um, I'm very honored to be asked to speak at this uh, Congress in Jamaica, and it's wonderful to see a lot of old friends and to make some new friends as well. Um, I'm a pediatric neurologist. Um, um, so just to acknowledge, I have a large team um, behind me, um, uh, quite a lot in London, and also um, teams in Tanzania, Kenya, uh, Nigeria. We've actually got a, a, an EU grant uh, for training, which uh, Jacques Elion is also involved with. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, CNS in sickle cell disease. Um, and we've talked about stroke as though it's just uh, one thing um, and, and you have a stroke and everyone knows what that is and, uh, uh, and then they know that they have to transfuse forever and that's the end of it. Um, I'm just going to um, say that in adult uh, neurology we've known for a long long time that there are a number of causes of strokes and a number of different vasculopathies uh, and the same has been very clear in pediatric stroke since we were able to do initially CT, remember that's only come from the 1970s and later MRI from the 1990s. And I had the privilege of working at Great Ormond Street for 10 years and looking at uh, pediatric stroke in general and pediatric stroke in sickle cell disease in particular. And I have seen pretty much everything that's uh, ever been described. I haven't actually personally seen a fat embolism that I've recognized, but I've seen pretty well everything else. Um, so you can have, whoops, sorry, uh, having the same problem with the buttons that uh, Graham had yesterday. Uh, so this is um, an arterial ischemic stroke. That's what you all know is a stroke. And here is the occlusion of the middle cerebral artery. Maybe if that child had, had been in a transcranial Doppler screening program, this, it would have been picked up at the stenotic stage. But this child, who was doing fan so fantastically well at school that she never came to clinic, didn't get screened. And actually, this is 15 years ago anyway, so she has a big MCA stroke. However, I have also seen a spontaneous intracranial intracerebral hemorrhage, as I have done in general pediatric population. Uh, this child came into Southampton, where there are only 18 children with sickle cell anemia, and had a febrile convulsion, uh, and turned out to have an abscess, uh, to my surprise. Uh, uh, this child um, had a, whoops, uh, this, this child had a chest crisis and ended up with a posterior circulation stroke. Very good um, anatomical demonstration of where the posterior cerebral in part, uh, uh, territory actually is. These two children had sinovenous thrombosis. This is actually the empty delta sign in a child with pneumococcal meningitis and sagittal sinus thrombosis. And this one, I'm afraid we missed. This is a straight sinus thrombosis uh, in a child who presented uh, with seizures with SC disease um, and deteriorated with massive swelling and died, I'm afraid, of raised cranial pressure. This child uh, is uh, rather similar to the, uh, the parable that Graham told yesterday. This is a child who um, had a chest crisis, had a low hemoglobin of about five, was given a lot of blood very quickly, went from a hemoglobin of five to 14, and had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, and uh, this is recent. Uh, and then subsequently had uh, further seizures and actually turns out to have border zone ischemia. So this is this actually, this case illustrates uh, pretty well all the um, the, the things that can happen. And then this child has um, acute glomerulonephritis and developed silent infarct, supposedly, but actually um, you could see that if you saw them acute, the MRI acutely, that actually it was posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. So um, I've seen a lot of um, uh, attempts to teach me red cell hematology. Um, this is an attempt to uh, teach uh, 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 hematologists what uh, uh, you might think about if you're looking at a child with neurological complications. Commercial break, if anyone wants this, um, please email me and I will be very happy to send the slide. Um, actually, you can have all of my slides if you want them. Um, but this is just um, an attempt to, for you to be asking your neurologist, your neuroradiologist, what this might be. Because you can and you should be transfusing and getting oxygen and so on and so forth. But actually, you should be finding out what's wrong with your patient. Um, we also know that um, patients with sickle cell disease have progressive silent infarction, uh, and this is from uh, the, uh, my colleague uh, Jamie Kowadler, uh, and you can see the silent infarct, um, whoops, sorry, uh, 
the silent infarct here, uh, and then uh, further silent infarct, silent infarction. Of course, many of these children do have cognitive complications if you actually ask the mum. Uh, when I was in clinic with Jane Evans in the 90s, I was trying to educate my son and get him to do extra maths, uh, and all the mothers of the children with sickle cell disease was doing exactly the same thing. Uh, they would come and say, actually, he really is struggling. I'm trying as hard as I possibly can, but actually, it's just not making any difference. Listen to those mums. It's really important. Just to top up on um, uh, some information you saw yesterday, um, uh, Jamie um, Kawadla built on the work of Alex Hogan, which was shown yesterday, um, and did a further meta-analysis um, from all the studies using Wexler full-scale IQ, um, and uh, also with uh, MRI to distinguish um, children with silent infarction uh, here and uh, no silent infarction. So here's my patient with a big stroke. These are the stroke children. These are the silent infarction infarction children, there's the MRI. These are the children with sickle cell disease and no silent infarction, and these are the controls. This is um, meta-analysis in 2016. And the important message here is that the children with the silent infarction are still, with, sorry, without the silent infarction, are still doing uh, worse than their sibling controls in terms of full-scale IQ. So some of it is the silent infarction, and some of it something else. What are we missing? Well, um, we may be missing uh, progressive um, in, uh, uh, deterioration in brain structure beyond the resolution of the MRI at 1.5 Tesla, which is what most of the original data were collected on, and even beyond the, uh, the uh, resolution of a 3T scanner. And this is our data from the silent infarct transfusion trial, uh, which um, looked, uh, uh, which was published in BJ Heem a couple of years ago by Jamie again. Uh, and you can see that basically um, the children with sickle cell anemia in the silent infarct transfusion trial are actually losing. Uh, uh, brain substance, brain volume, um, uh, at a rate which is higher than previously reported in healthy children. One of the uh, weaknesses, of course, of uh, much of the data is that we there were relatively few studies, including the silent infarct transfusion trial, which actually collected control data. So this is previously published data. And I'm sorry to say um, that I'm afraid there wasn't a benefit of um, blood transfusion in this situation. If anything, the children um, in the blood transfusion fusion arm actually had worsening atrophy compared with the uh, children uh, who were in the control arm here. So there's no evidence from these data that uh, transfusion prevented progressive atrophy. Uh, there, there are data from uh, uh, Wang's group showing that um, uh, uh, there's progression in the uh, cognitive problems in young children, uh, and we have data in London, which is a bit more cheerful than that. Actually, our, uh, our normal children were actually gaining both verbal and performance IQ, and the children with the sickle cell disease and strokes were actually losing IQ points. Um, however, both the children with the normal uh, MRI and the children uh, with the lesions, uh, silent lesions, were actually maintaining their IQs. They weren't I increasing as the normal children were, but they weren't actually deteriorating. Um, and another just throw in, uh, we, I had a, uh, a medical student who actually read geography first uh, and knew how to plot the distance between points extremely accurately. And she looked at the distance um, between your house uh, and uh, the nearest main A road in London, in the East London cohort. And she found that the children whose IQ was going down actually, I'm afraid, had the, uh, whoops, had the, uh, the shortest distance between their house and their road. There's a lot of interest. Um, there's some very nice data from China um, uh, showing that actually dementia in adults is related to air pollution. We should probably be looking at this in sickle cell disease as well. Okay, so I've shown you some full-scale IQ data. 
could we use full-scale IQ in randomized controlled trials? In fact, it has been done, of course. I did mention yesterday that buried in the supplement to the SIT trial are the IQ data, which didn't show any difference in performance IQ, verbal IQ, or full-scale IQ uh, from baseline to uh, exit at three years later. What about hydroxyurea? Well, there have been no trials, to my knowledge, with a, a cognitive endpoint that have been published so far. There's uh, Eve Puffer's data from 2007 suggesting a benefit uh, on various cognitive tests with hydroxyurea. Um, and uh, Win Wang's data published as an ASH abstract, uh, which actually showed um, a statistically significant benefit um, from hydroxyurea over one year. But it's no slightly helped by the fact that the, the children are not on hydroxyurea uh, actually deteriorated slightly. But interestingly, processing speed, which I'm going to talk about next, um, actually improved in both groups, uh, both um, the children on the hydroxyurea and the children uh, who were not on hydroxyurea. And I'll talk about that um, more. Processing speed. Uh, any of you ever taken a Wexler IQ test? I haven't. I've avoided it like the plague. <laughs> I really don't want to know. And I didn't want my son's IQ tested either. He's doing fine, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you um, Coding um, is the core of the processing speed index. Uh, actually, it's quite a tricky test to do. And we have found uh, that a lot of um, the kids with sickle cell disease take a long time doing it because they're so worried about getting it wrong. In fact, interestingly, we found that um, effect also when we we went to La Paz in Bolivia and looked at children living at altitude. They were accurate, but they were slow. Um, and so uh, there may be an effect, um, direct effect of the hypoxia on coding. But actually, uh, this does have its own problem in that you may then, next time they see this, they may get quicker just because they've seen it before and they know what to do. Uh, we've been interested in processing speed for a while. Um, this is Hannah Stotesbury, one of my PhD students, uh, who's undertaken a, uh, a meta-analysis, uh, rather like Jamie's, of the full-scale IQ. She's undertaken a meta-analysis of the processing speed index. So thank you very much to all of you who've given us data. We, we are in process of uh, pulling this together as a manuscript, finally. Um, interestingly, um, again, the, uh, the children with the uh, with the um, sickle cell, sorry, with the silent infarct, do do worse. But the children with this, uh, with with normal MRI with sickle cell disease still have a, a worse processing speed than the children uh, who are healthy controls. And actually, that comes out um, in the meta-analysis to be a 10-point difference in processing speed index between silent uh, children with silent infarct and healthy control. With the, sorry, children with silent infarct negative and healthy controls. Uh, and Hannah's gone on to uh, look at our own uh, London cohort, uh, and uh, she published this in 2018 alongside her very nice MRI data. And children, uh, patients had significantly low processing speed index than controls by about nine uh, and uh, nine points. Um, and importantly, the trend for lower scale, full scale IQ was actually abolished when PSI was included as a covariant. Um, and there are no differences between patients with and without SCI. So again, suggesting that we may be looking at something beyond the silent infarction. Okay, so what about um, using other endpoints? Uh, Anna Hood, um, who's worked at WashU initially and then in Cincinnati, has recently joined me as a postdoc uh, on an NIH fellowship. Uh, and she, this is data from that you saw yesterday, so I'm not going to show you the graphs, um, but she uh, used the NIH to, uh, toolbox um, and found that uh, uh, children who were in the silent infarct transfusion trial uh, who uh, had uh, were near, very close to the transfusion had higher uh, scores than when they were uh, not transfused, and the, the, but both of these uh, were ba uh, were basically different from hydroxyurea. Basically, the, the blood transfusion was doing you a lot of good just uh, just when you just had it, uh, but actually the the effect tails off. Whereas uh, hydroxyurea doesn't have such a useful effect, but it's still better than nothing. Um, however, and and the, also the sorry, the change in hemoglobin was significantly related to the change in executive function, suggesting that blood is good. 
for you and I absolutely no doubt that blood is good for the brain um, however it's a question of how you give it um, uh, but we did she did also see a practice effect um, with the NIH toolbox uh, for um, processing speed uh, and we have been really quite concerned about that um, Michelle Downs who uh, did her PhD with me looking at young children uh, did use the NIH toolbox again not in a controlled trial fashion so she just got one cross-sectional uh, test um, and she found that um, in the young children um, I, have, I have good news that there isn't a difference um, between uh, children and, uh, with sickle cell disease and controls when you're very young so it does seem that one of the possible reasons for deterioration is that actually you're slowing down and one of the questions is why is that happening uh, we've um, had a problem uh, with uh, processing speed uh, and uh, from the Wexler scales, but we've, we've uh, had Alex Hogan uh, who's now gone on to do medicine uh, have a very long think with me about what you might do and she suggested we actually use cancellation which is a really simple test you could do this anywhere in the world it's just a, um, if you're an adult you would be uh, cancelling out all the E's from a, um, a pe page full of letters if you're a child you cancel out one of the animals uh, and this just just shows the sheet uh, we did a controlled trial of um, CPAP um, uh, with, for six weeks, uh, and I'm not going to go into any detail. This was published in 2009, uh, but just to say that we did indeed have a problem with the processing speed index here, uh, increased in both uh, the uh, patients and the controls, but uh, the cancellation actually only improved in the patients, suggesting there's much less of a, of a, of a practice effect. And this is uh, preliminary data from our POMS2B trial where we uh, undertook uh, CPAP for six months uh, and uh, uh, did uh, cancellation as a primary endpoint pre and post. Uh, and uh, th there is a, uh, an Im improvement in cancellation which favors APAP. This is not statistical, statistically uh, significant in the intention to treat population, but if you're on hydroxyurea as well, it does suggest that cancellation improves and again this may be a basis for improvement overall um, just to mention executive function again uh, uh, one other simple test to do is actually the brief which is a, a study or uh, which is a, a questionnaire a little bit like a women's magazine questionnaire uh, where you uh, work out what your personality type is but actually it's rather cleverer than that because somebody peels off the pages and I've done this myself so that you actually uh, can't cheat on it uh, and w uh, in our, um, our, brief, our POMS 2B um, I'm pleased to say that the global executive and metacognition uh, parts of the brief actually um, favoured APAP, uh, again suggesting there may be some uh, benefit in terms of executive function. Okay, back to something you probably know a bit more about. This is a transcranial Doppler. Here's the uh, velocity of 200 centimeters per second. Here's a conditional velocity of 182. Uh, and please note that you really must uh, measure the time average maximum of the mean of the maximum velocity and not the peak systolic velocity. So certainly not in children. I think there's some data from adults suggesting that you may be able to use that. Moving on from that, um, uh, we also see uh, uh, vasculopathy on MR angiography. It's so far mainly been described as stenosis, but of course MR angiography is not measuring, um, uh, it's not actually a structural measurement of the vessel wall. It's looking at velocity um, of flow. And so we de described a turbulence index, um, Norma Domini published this in 2017 and Mboka, Mboka Jacob and Edward Kija who are both in Tanzania um, have taken this work forward. Edward's work, work has been published and Mboka's is, uh, is, is uh, in submission. Uh, so we, we're looking at a relatively normal looking MRA uh, and uh, mild uh, turbulence, uh, more severe uh, stenosis and then occlusion. We don't see very many more and more in, um, uh, in Tanzania or in London but of course it does happen. I would also emphasize that we do see children uh, with uh, neck vessel disease in sickle cell disease and it's probably a really important cause of stroke and cognitive deterioration at, in adults. Uh, we don't have a very good screening test for it at the moment because the Doppler is trickier to do uh, but uh, please think if you've got a patient with, uh, with a, a stroke please think about the uh, vasculopathy being uh, neck.
Um, and this is just to show, um, that again, this is published by Domini, but just to say this is still happening. Uh, in our uh, longer CPAP trial, we actually uh, and, uh, saw one child uh, who had uh, an internal carotid on her first scan uh, and lost it um, by the second. Okay, it's fine. Uh, so, uh, and we, uh, low mean overnight oxygen saturation does appear to be associated with, uh, with uh, progression of the vasculopathy. One other thing to mention is that um, we had a very nice talk yesterday about uh, venous side, and I've already mentioned uh, uh, venous thrombosis, uh, but actually you may be getting clots through um, a patent frame and veili coming up from the pelvic veins, the legs, uh, and I just draw your attention to the FAST study, which was published uh, by Michael Dowling et al. in 2017, and we actually saw, saw um, an excess of pulmonary in, uh, uh, shunting um, in, in patients with sickle cell disease and stroke. Briefly to mention uh, way, other ways of looking at the white matter, uh, this is diffusion tensor imaging, which we've uh, looked at quite a lot. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a, an association both with hemoglobin and also with oxygen saturation. Uh, and uh, we also saw a, uh, a relationship between the, uh, the statistics, the track-based spatial statistics, and processing speed index, suggesting that actually this might be a way of looking at the white matter abnormalities that perhaps underline and underpin the problems with processing speed index. And literally just this week, um, uh, I'm delighted to say the Toronto group published uh, the, their data on the effect of hydroxyurea on quantitative MRI. This is their um, CVR data. This is where you can look at effect of um, breathing CO2, which should increase your blood flow, but doesn't so much in sickle cell disease. Um, and the CBF is higher. Um, but interestingly, um, their mean diffusivity uh, statistics were abnormal in the children with sickle cell disease um, on and off hydroxyurea, but there appeared to be some benefit of the hydroxyurea. A quick um, question. Um, we're very interested in arterial oxygen content, oxygen delivery, and oxygen extraction fraction, as well as CMRO2. Can anybody tell me what uh, the, uh, the, effect, uh, the actual um, numbers in the equation should be for hemoglobin F? Because I haven't been able to find the answer to that question. If anyone's got it, um, I'd be very grateful to know. Okay, um, I've talked to you about um, hypoxia and ways of looking at the brain. Just very briefly, um, other uh, approaches. Um, one, we've heard a lot about glutamine yesterday and a little bit about arginine. What about just giving enough protein? to patients who are lacking. Uh, we ran a trial in Tanzania of Plumpy Sup, which is a ready-to-use food stuff, uh, with a, with a, uh, a flow-mediated dilatation endpoint in the brachial plexus. Uh, and uh, we interestingly found that there was no difference between the, 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 the ready-to-use food stuff supplemented with arginine and that which just was ready to use food stuff, uh, flow mediated dilatation improved in both. And finally, um, I am just about, I hope, to start um, a trial of Montelukast in the UK. Uh, the, re the rationale for that is that um, Montelukast does decrease adenoidal size, in, and we have data from, uh, from our preschool studies suggesting that 90% um, uh, of London children snore. It might be better just to improve the air pollution, but I can't probably move that mountain on my own. Um, and Montelukast is widely used in, in uh, asthma in children. Uh, and, um, um, we are uh, uh, literally just about to start that, and if anyone's interested, I can gladly send you the protocol. So in summary, uh, all stroke syndromes are seen. Uh, there's comp cognitive compromise, uh, overt stroke more than covert, but normal MRI do, uh, is affected, those with normal MRI is affected. Uh, there are a number of possible endpoints for trials, and there are cognitive um, problems uh, in, uh, across the ages, uh, and they, these may have real world effects, um, particularly in maths. And um, again, I just remember the mothers of the children that I saw in clinic in the 90s. Thank you. One word, one word. Okay. <laughs>
Okay, very brief answer. Um, I have also seen this in an SC patient um, and a few others. Um, please uh, look at their sleep disorder breathing in a nutshell um, and any other risk factors. Uh, JJ Strauss wrote a nice paper about other risk factors, but the bit that's often missed in the general adult population is the sleep disorder breathing, and my patient had terrible obstructive sleep apnea at the age of 30 and stroked. I don't, I'm not a hematologist. <laughs> Yes, I am. Okay, our next speaker is Parker Roo, who is a respiratory physician, and she's been working with us in the NIH, uh, you know, as a, a consult on the chest complications that we have. So I'm very pleased to introduce Parker, and she's going to talk about the Clinical research priorities in sickle cell lung disease across the life. Well, that was a perfect transition uh, to the respiratory talk, so thank you uh, <laughs> for that segue. Um, and then I will also start with the disclaimer I don't have a button. I'm not a hematologist. <laughs> um, but what I'd like to share with you today, um, I think, is exciting. So, um, uh, a group of uh, pulmonologists that see sickle cell patients um, got together um, and for trainees in the room I'll mention that I met someone in a statistics class and we both had this idea and we ran with it and it actually worked out. So um, I worked with a pediatric pulmonologist at Hopkins named Christy Sadramelli, a pediatric pulmonologist at BU named Robin Cohen, and an adult pulmonologist at BU Elizabeth Klings and we approached the ATS to say we'd like to put together a workshop, a multidisciplinary workshop. And so I'll go through the clinical and research priorities that we set from this workshop, and I'll probably leave you with more questions than answers, um, but that's why we're all here today. Um, so <clears throat> to think about the pulmonary complications of sickle cell disease, so pulmonary complications are some of the most common etiology of accelerated sickle cell morbidity and mortality, um, and that's been shown in existing uh, retrospective and prospective studies, implicating nearly every lung cell type and structure. And as we all know, sickle cell disease occurs in racial and ethnic groups that are profoundly impacted by social determinants of health and commonly have poor access to health care. So all of these factors have uh, led to significant health disparities in our limited understanding of pulmonary complications and the impact on disease progression. And so if we look at uh, lung health and sickle cell disease, it's likely a cycle where <coughs> uh, inflammatory conditions within the lung then impact uh, VQ mismatch, uh, vasoclusive events, infarction, <coughs> and pain. Uh, and if we look at low resource settings, um, there are additional factors that impact uh, sickle cell lung health. So in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, here in Jamaica and India and other places, there's additional pressures such as childhood pneumonia, which is a, the most common uh, cause of under five mortality, other infections including malaria, um, which uh, induce an inflammatory state, tuberculosis, tobacco, uh, now vaping, um, and of course, uh, we had the nice talk on uh, marijuana products. Um, air pollution, again, is something that came up in just uh, this most recent talk. Um, so all these factors are additional uh, pressure on the inflammatory state. <clears throat> in addition, as a uh, pulmonologist uh, having treated cystic fibrosis patients, I think we have a special attention to the need for transition from pediatric to adult care. So before there were many targeted therapies in cystic fibrosis, having a network of transition into adulthood was one of the first impacts on improving uh, mortality uh, in the early 20s. And <clears throat> USCDC data shows that in the span from 15 to 19 year olds, mortality does double in the age group from 20 to 40. So these are important things to consider that while there have been landmark advances in uh, increasing uh, uh, survival through childhood in places where uh, patients have access to standard of care, there's still significant issues with uh, longevity uh, in adulthood. Um, and so those uh, uh, benefits have not been borne out in adults. Um, in one study of adolescent and young adults, 41% um, <clears throat> of uh, just over 300 subjects suffered the uh, first ACS episode during the first seven years <clears throat> uh, in adult care, so that's uh, an important issue. So there's a clear need to improve coordination among adult and pediatric providers, and also to have a multidisciplinary approach, again, as was addressed during uh, the neurology talk just before me. And the availability of adult hematologists and pulmonologists to transition care is a challenge, unfortunately, in all resource settings. And so <clears throat> we got together uh, in Washington, D.C. at one of the American Thoracic Society meetings 
Um, and we brought a, a very diverse group together. Uh, we had 19 pediatric and 13 adult physicians, uh, one patient advocate uh, with sickle cell lung disease. Uh, we had a librarian help us do a systematic survey of literature. Um, we also had 18 pulmonologists, 12 hematologists, two emergency medicine physicians, and representation from uh, Jamaica, Mali, uh, the UK, and the US. And this afforded us to really get all stakeholders at the table to identify what are, could be the clinical and research priorities. And the, cha the biggest challenge is that um, we don't have a lot of high quality evidence, uh, in particular for pulmonary complications. So as we address the idea we're getting all these uh, uh, experts together, we just cannot approach writing guidelines. We really just need to set priorities to how we can move the field uh, forward. Uh, because currently there's inconsistent or low quality of evidence study design available, non-uniform classification of, for example, acute chest syndrome. I'll get into the limitations of uh, the uh, de definition of acute chest. Um, <clears throat> inconsistent interpretation strategies for pulmonary function testing over time, so it makes it hard to compare studies. Um, and then again, there's a lack, lack of longitudinal data. Um, so, uh, you know, what we need to do in the, in the modern era of study design and in the modern era of current uh, treatment availability, we need to um, kind of reassess what has been studied before, in particular in areas of acute chest syndrome. Uh, and so <clears throat> the workshop identified priority areas in sickle cell lung disease, uh, acute chest syndrome, lower airway disease and pulmonary function, sleep disordered breathing and recurrent desaturation uh, is something that could potentially impact multiple different outcomes, and then, of course, pulmonary vascular complications, uh, pulmonary hypertension, and venous thromboembolism. Today, in the interest of time, I'll focus on the limitations of the definition for acute chest syndrome, and then also talk about um, some uh, emerging areas in non-asthmatic lower airway disease. <clears throat> I'll mention a little bit about current evidence in sleep disordered breathing, um, and uh, the prior speaker already addressed the, the current POMS-2B trial. Um, and then vascular complications, uh, I'll be followed by a cardiologist who will also address the right heart, and we heard about venous thromboembolism yesterday. So in terms of acute chest syndrome, <clears throat> remains a major cause of sickle cell morbidity. 50% uh, of patients have at least one lifetime episode. Um, in children, uh, there's approximately 21 events per 100 person years, uh, and that decreases uh, in adults, um, and ACS is a history, uh, is a risk factor. Um, but in adults, there's four times the mortality rate. Um, and older studies demonstrate that uh, acute chest accounts for 25% of premature sickle deaths. But again, I think that needs to be reevaluated in uh, the modern treatment area. And death rates have otherwise been described to be similar across sickle genotypes. So <clears throat> looking at uh, ACF past phys physiology, something that we all know is that it's multifactorial in terms of uh, how it arises. So this study from Vichinsky and colleagues in 2000 looked at 30 centers across the US. They evaluated 671 ACS episodes across 500 patients and found 3% mortality. And with a very thorough examination, um, <clears throat> including bronchoscopy in a large subset of patients, they only found a specific etiology in 38%, with 8% uh, having fat emboli syndrome, and 30% with a specific infectious etiology that was predominated by atypical organisms, chlamydia in adults, mycoplasma in children, and then otherwise uh, viral etiologies. And so in acute chest syndrome, we still have not yet defined genetic and non-genetic factors that predispose to different uh, underlying phenotypes. Looking at uh, a little bit more recent epidemiology from a nationwide inpatient sample, which has important caveats as it is from uh, billing uh, coding, um, but this showed a mortality of 1.6%. Of, of, uh, Importantly in the red oval, in each year, <clears throat> the number of hospitalizations was still increasing. Again, the, because it's billing code data, it's a little bit of a, of a caveat, but now we can look at a study from uh, Bashishvili and uh, Katerina Maniti um, that looked at comprehensive management and how that reduced the incidence mortality of acute chest syndrome. And importantly, they did a thorough medical record review to identify that these were confirmed cases of acute chest. Now I'll get into the limitations that we have with what the definition is, but this was a <clears throat> thorough effort to, as they um, uh, began the comprehensive uh, sickle cell care center in the Montefiore Medical Center to show that an improvement of uh, education intervention um, in outpatient during ED visits and then during ED and inpatient visits improved acute chest length of stay and also ICU length of stay. So looking at acute chest syndrome as really a basket, it's an umbrella term. During our workshop, people debated, well, maybe we should rename it, but 
everyone identified, we have to understand it before we can really rename it and, and have a different ontology. And so it's important to think about that the current uh, definition does not account for the timing of onset of symptoms or the rate of decline. That was an important contribution to the updated definition of acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, in the Berlin definition. So for ARDS now, you have to have an onset of symptoms within seven days, has to be acute. This is also, so I think my commercial break will be please look at an old chest x-ray. You cannot identify a new infiltrate unless you have looked at prior imaging. So that's just always really important to do. In addition, we know that there's multiple distinct or overlapping etiologies, and there's differences in pediatric and adult presentation. So it's important to think about uh, how this could help us have an uh, improved definition of acute chest syndrome. And in terms of known uh, clinical subtypes, rapidly progressive ACS has been identified as an area that has much higher mortality. So if uh, subjects present with respiratory failure within 24 hours after symptoms, so that's defined as requiring three liters of oxygen <coughs> um, to maintain a O2 sat greater than 90% or uh, mechanical ventilation. Um, one study looked at uh, patients at Mount Sinai um, and Vanderbilt, and they identified that 21% of adults um, fell into the basket of rapidly progressive acute chest syndrome, and only 2% of children, and that there was significantly increased mortality, 6% versus none in the non-rapidly progressive group. Um, in uh, multivariable regression, they only found an independent predictor of thrombocytopenia with an odds ratio of close to five. And so looking at um, this data from that study, um, <coughs> it appears that there could be a thrombotic microangiopathy-like subgroup uh, contributing to the rapid progression. And this has also been supported in other studies, in particular in autopsy studies, they have found uh, thrombotic microangiopathy. Um, and so this includes uh, multi-organ failure, altered mental status, acute kidney injury, liver function impairment, all uh, in the setting of thrombocytopenia. And other emerging data in terms of looking at the underlying pathophysiology of acute chest and really understanding what's happening in the lung uh, comes from uh, Gosch and Aforiaqua. And they identified expression of endothelial P selectin mediates acute chest in sickle mice. So in the B6 mice, <coughs> mortality is higher following heme challenge in the presence of P selectin. And heme induces severe hypoxemia and lung damage with pulmonary edema with P selectin. So on this upper graph here, <coughs> you can see in the uh, clear circles that the O2 saturation was in these mice was down in, to the low 80s. Um, with the P-selectin, and then also on the right-hand side, you see increased pulmonary edema on that uh, parenchymal lung. And they also went a step further to show that anti-P-selectin antibody blocks P-selectin adhesion, <clears throat> potentially inhibiting entrapment of sickle cells um, to allow less extracellular heme to sustain the ACS inflammatory cycle. And so if you go back to that first graph I showed with the lung, the sickle complications, and I think that just allows an inflammatory cycle to continue. So blocking P-selected adhesion may prevent or uh, treat ACS. Um, and then looking at uh, current existing guidelines on the management of acute chest syndrome um, from the British uh, standards of uh, hematology committee um, uh, brought out from uh, Joe Howard, you can see that <coughs> In terms of the key recommendations that are based on randomized control trials with consistent evidence, there's only three uh, that are mentioned. So incentive spirometry, um, penicillin uh, prophylaxis and vaccination, and hydroxyurea. Um, and so it's just important to note that we only have the general preventive uh, measures that are used in sickle cell in order to treat uh, you know, one of the most concerning uh, end organ complications. Uh, so in terms of acute chest syndrome, key unanswered questions include what criteria should be used to classify ACS as mild, moderate, or severe, um, and how do we define subtypes, which patients are at increased risk and may benefit from primary or secondary prevention, um, can we identify a prodrome? That's another area that within acute respiratory distress syndrome has made a lot of progress in the last uh, five or 10 years to try to identify people before they end up in the ICU. And how should patients with acute onset of signs and symptoms concerning for ACS be managed in low resource settings. I don't have a lot of time during this talk to talk about the idea that when you don't have chest x-ray available, how can you rely on a definition that requires a new infiltrate? So how can we identify these subjects in lower resource settings? So moving on to our second priority area, lower airway disease and pulmonary function. So the NHLBI guidelines, <coughs> which someone else mentioned are a 300-page tome, uh, recommend against screening PFTs in asymptomatic patients. 
Um, and so it's important to note that that's because there's lack of evidence for an impact on outcomes. However, if patients have dyspnea, then getting pulmonary function testing is an important element, particularly uh, as young adults and, and into adulthood, is an important uh, parameter to evaluate um, what could be an underlying cause of that dyspnea. Is it something with their sickle cell? Is it another uh, potential co comorbidity? So PFTs are essential in evaluating patients with dyspnea. Um, another important uh, element that's come out in the last several years is that reduced FEV1 does carry an increased mortality risk. So a 6% reduction in FEV1 is associated with an 11% increased hazard of death. And you know, as I get together uh, with Matt Shea and John Tisdale to look at their uh, pulmonary outcomes data, we can compare that to what the longitudinal mean decline of FEV1 might be expected in the general population to see how much of a change is there and how, how relevant is that. Um, because one longitudinal study from the cooperative study data did find that the mean decline was twice that of the general population. And FEV1 across pulmonary disorders is commonly an important outcome uh, for mortality. It's also one of the most important outcomes for mortality in cystic fibrosis, so it's something to pay attention to. Um, and while asthma has been shown to risk, it increased the risk of ACS and uh, Jennifer Knight Madden uh, definitely helped move that uh, field forward. It's important to um, identify that a lot of other pulmonary, affection, pulmonary function testing um, has not been related well to mortality um, and or there's conflicting data, again, from the issue of having a differing interpretation of pulmonary function testing. So it's important to better understand the pathophysiology of lower airway disease in non-asthmatics. Pulmonary inflammation and airway hyperactivity and airway resistance are observed in individuals without a clinical diagnosis of asthma. And again, I was heartened to hear about the study with Montelukast. There's a lot to be considered about the inflammatory milieu uh, in the lung. Um, and we need to formally distinguish within the pulmonary community between wheezing due to comorbid asthma and sickle cell specific mechanisms. So two examples I'll go through are exaggerated sickle cell related inflammation um, and also uh, increased pulmonary vascular congestion. So one study from uh, Glassberg looked at inhaled steroids that was found to, in this pilot study, was found to reduce pain and soluble VCAM levels in non-asthmatic sickle cell patients. And this was a, a triple-blind randomized control trial, a single study, <coughs> uh, that evaluated uh, feasibility, pain, um, and uh, soluble VCAM levels in 54 non-asthmatics. And mometasone was associated with a decreased pain score uh, by 1.4 points um, and did reduce soluble VCAM levels. So non-asthma-related systemic inflammatory markers were also found to decrease. So I think this is important that this was done in non-asthmatics. And then looking at respiratory mechanics and pulmonary capillary blood volume in sickle cell disease, compared to healthy controls, children with sickle cell have an elevated cardiac output and pulmonary blood flow at rest. Increased pulmonary blood flow due to chronic anemia has been correlated with airway obstruction and respiratory airway uh, resistance. And so, Lunt and uh, Greeno looked at uh, measuring resistance using impulse oscillometry, which allows you to look much more clearly at the smaller airways, and that's particularly important uh, in children as opposed to doing spirometry. And they measured resistance post-transfusion, and they found increased airways resistance, a decrease in FEV1 and vital capacity, and no change in the ratio of those. And again, this was done in steady state uh, patients that were on a routine transfusion protocol. So it's not to argue that there's a problem with transfusion. We debated that yesterday. But, but if there's an important indication for transfusion, it's important to understand how the uh, blood dynamics may affect the airways and breathing. So going through these unanswered questions, you know, what are the characteristics of lung function um, across the lifespan? How do uh, lung function findings in children affect lung function findings in adults? Um, what are the features and pathophysiology of the inflammatory airways um, outside of asthma? And does lower airway disease impact clinical outcomes in sickle cell disease? So moving on to sleep disordered breathing and desaturation. Um, sleep disordered breathing encompasses obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, and sleep-related hypoventilation, which can be sustained or intermittent. Adults with sickle cell are at risk for central sleep apnea due to opioid use or uh, congestive heart failure. And pathophysiological consequences may include endothelial dysfunction with altered nitric oxide bioactivity, chronic systemic inflammation, or increased expression of cell adhesion molecules. <clears throat> 
And looking at uh, sleep disorder breathing and desaturation, uh, there's a lot more evidence that's needed to understand how we interpret screening for sickle cell patients as compared to the general population. So it appears to be common. So in unselected uh, patients in pediatrics, the estimates have ranged from 30 up to 79 percent. In adults, uh, closer to 50 percent. And it's thought that it may impact sickle cell mor morbidity and mortality. There's limited evidence to define the sickle cell uh, population based on normative data for sleep physiology. And for that matter, both in pulmonary function testing and sleep, there's a dearth of data in minority populations for the healthy uh, population as well in order to have appropriate uh, comparatives. And the NHLBL guidelines recommend screening for OSA with symptoms only. However, traditional risk factors such as obesity, presence of snoring, and reported sleep complaints do not reliably differentiate sickle cell patients. So <clears throat> this is a sickle cell screening, sleep disorder breathing uh, screening study in sickle cell patients done at Howard University. And here <clears throat> um, you can see that of 20 patients that were unselected, uh, uh, had no prior diagnosis of having sleep-related issues, 50% um, were found to have an AHI um, uh, apnea hypopnea index greater than 5, which is consistent with having uh, at least mild uh, sleep apnea. Um, <clears throat> and importantly, the BMI was higher in the group with uh, AHI that was higher, still within the normal range, though. Um, and so, you know, that may not be a factor that you can use to screen for your patients. Um, <clears throat> and in systolic blood pressure was higher in the group with uh, sleep apnea, um, and health-related quality of life was lower. There was a trend toward a difference in the, <clears throat> toward a lower six-minute walk test. Um, but otherwise, between the groups, there was no difference in a well-established screening tool. There was no difference in narcotic use, which I think might have been surprising, but again, it's a small uh, pilot study. No difference in gender, no difference in uh, BNP levels or TR velocity. And from this study, here we can see a graph of the minutes of oxygen desaturation that were less than 90% by AHI and a hemoglobin of less than 9. And what's important to see here is that three of the um, nine subjects that had the hemoglobin less than nine had significant desaturation overnight, even though they had an AHI that was normal. So oxygen desaturation uh, at nighttime without any signs or symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea could still be an important issue. And uh, the POMS-2B trial um, was already discussed uh, well by uh, the prior speaker. Um, but again, just the importance to look at neurological outcomes um, as a factor from sleep in addition to pain or other uh, potential outcomes that we might already consider. Um, so in terms of the important questions, um, <clears throat> one of the main questions, I think, for sleep disordered breathing is to consider who should be approached uh, for sleep. So one quick commercial break I can have as well is our document is meant to be comprehensive. Um, so you can go through when you have your own time to see all the different questions and the underlying uh, reasoning uh, for each of these uh, raised unanswered questions. And in terms of the pulmonary vascular complications, <clears throat> this will be a nice transition to the next uh, talk by our cardiologist, Vanda Nisaktiv. Um, but two of the most important questions that remain an issue for pulmonary hypertension are in the asymptomatic patient, does evaluation for sickle cell related pulmonary hypertension impact clinical outcomes? And does the early identification and treatment improve outcomes? And again, we've had our discussion of venous thromboembolism. I won't make everyone stand up right now, um, but just to remember to think about that for your patients. So in closing, the clinical and research priorities in sickle cell disease across the lifespan um, are identified in these four uh, main priority areas. And so really what we need to do now is in the modern treatment area, re-identify, you know, how can we better assess what the definition of acute chest syndrome is? If we're going to use acute chest syndrome as enrollment criteria for studies in gene therapy, for studies in uh, bone marrow transplantation, then we need to make sure that we all have a common understanding of what acute chest syndrome should mean in the current era. Um, so with that, I would be happy to take questions for the questions that I've posed to you all. Okay. Two to three. Minutes. Please, Julie.
something where previous chest X-rays are not available. How accurate or how um, sensitive do you think uh, peripheral oxygen saturation is? Because perspective, this is something that we've been using, and we found that it's relatively helpful in confirming or um, identifying the patients who are at high risk of having a diagnosis of acute chest. Yeah, so <clears throat> I like how you phrased the question because I think it's it's very nonspecific, kind of obviously, and so you'd want to make sure that you were treating for other potential underlying infections, you know, as an example. But I think what oxygen saturation in particular can do with help with the risk stratification. So who's going to die from their acute chest? Who, you know, and you can see that the change in saturation over a period of time so that you could use that as an assessment for the rapidly progressive group. Um, you know, another thing um, that Vandana um, uh, will discuss is the use of ultrasound in low resource settings. So I think, again, using ultrasound, and I, you know, I didn't have time to go through all that data here, but people have looked at bedside ultrasound during acute chest syndrome as a way to further stratify what do we think is going on in the lung parenchyma. So I think that's another possibility um, for low resource settings. can't see me, but yes. I have a question here. Yes, so I can hear this you. is coming from a non-pulmonologist. Uh, you have alluded to airway hyper-responsiveness that is present in sickle cell disease patients at baseline. Uh, Michael Devon and our group has done a lot of work to show um, that airway hyper-responsiveness or airway hyper-reactivity uh, predisposes to many morbidities that you have alluded to including acute chest, and Iliad Wichinsky's article also showed a very high incidence of airway hyperreactivity in children with acute chest syndrome. Could you talk about that a bit? Sure. Um, so, you know, partly it's just limited by time, but there's definitely a lot of data evaluating airway hyperresponsiveness. Um, there, are, there are some conflicting studies. There are some studies that show that it does not uh, affect mortality. Um, one other consideration is whether or not when to assess patients for airway hyperresponsiveness, uh, and uh, you know whether there might be some risk if you were performing a medical lean challenge, for example, of inducing a, a pain crisis. Um, so I think along the lines of um, understanding that there's a spectrum of airway disorders uh, along asthma that even within non-asthmatics, you'll have individuals that have airway hyperresponsiveness but are otherwise not. Uh, asthmatic, and so that definitely has been shown uh, to increase uh, in increase risk. I think the issue is when you get down to a practical level is how do you apply that to a range of patients? You know, do you then look for individuals that um, don't have airway symptoms to evaluate whether they have hyperresponsiveness? Could that help us identify a, a subgroup that needs to be watched more closely? I think that still remains to be evaluated. You can come. You had mentioned that poor motion testing should not be routinely done. Um, on well, that that's the current guideline. So yeah, so just to I think pulmonologists, anyone that that has dyspnea, anyone that you'd like more information about their breathing, I think pulmonologists generally would advocate for having a low threshold for getting pulmonary function testing. But you know, as we might have some discussion during the, the later debate pro-con of you know, having specialists versus generalists today, I think it's also important to think about if you make a guideline recommendation that every you know, primary care provider seeing sickle cell patients should start ordering pulmonary function testing, we have to understand what we're going to do with that information. So that, I think part of that is the interpretation of those results from a specialist versus a generalist, if that makes sense. I was just wondering whether yeah. or not using borderline low oxygen saturation which has become almost a routine part of vital signs, um, whether or not that would influence you, especially if you have had several or even one episode of acute chest before. Yeah, so I, you know, I think I would favor having a low threshold for getting pulmonary function testing. And I think if you kind of take a step back to evaluate the patient in front of you for, you know, New York Heart Association class two symptoms are having some degree of dyspnea during daily activities, and I think you can make an argument in almost all sickle cell patients that they might have that degree of dyspnea. So I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. I think with that, we'll move on to the next speaker. I'm delighted to introduce Vandana uh, Sakdev. Uh, 
where he spoke at the last skiff. And it was uh, so well received that we thought we'd have her back again. So Bandana uh, works with uh, me in the, uh, with us in the uh, uh, sickle cell branch, and she's a cardiologist, and she's going to talk to us about the uh, cardiac complications of sickle cell disease. Thank you very much, Bandana. Good morning. So my job today is to try to convince you that we need to pay more attention to cardiovascular issues in sickle cell patients. So, great, then it's easy, I'm done. So um, the things that I'm gonna cover are why uh, are these cardiovascular complications important? Why do patients get them? And then I'll spend most of my time on what these complications are. Um, I'm gonna spread my purview a little bit. In addition to the heart, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the lungs and also about the periphery. So all of you have seen autopsy studies on sickle cell disease, but it's worth taking another look just um, at, at this contemporary study. Um, and you can see by the colors that the number's not coming up. Hmm, that's weird. Okay, well take my word for it that um, the red and the blue are about a third a piece. Um, so about two thirds of patients are dying of cardiovascular and respiratory problems. And um, the cardiovascular problems mainly are described in, in similar, va similar ways. Um, PEA, pulseless electrical alternance, is a very common finding on death reports. It's a very kind of vague diagnosis. It's really um, asystole, I guess, with no, um, no pulse. Um, other ventricular arrhythmias are seen as well. Myocardial infarction and heart failure are less commonly seen, but are also um, part of the problem. But there's a disconnect between the autopsy studies and the clinical studies. And this is a good study from um, not that long ago, the southeastern part of the United States. And um, the purpose of this study was to try to predict which clinical and, and historical features predicted risk of death. And so if you look at the top medical history, pulmonary hypertension, um, you've got the hazard ratios on the end there. Um, pulmonary hypertension by history was a significant predictor of high-risk patients. Um, the next couple of rows are systolic and diastolic. Hypertension didn't seem to pan out much in this particular analysis. Heart failure was important in terms of predicting mortality. The standard things that we think about, CNS complications, renal complications, they all were important. Um, but if you look down at the bottom, people on antihypertensive, they did have a higher risk also. So we're kind of finding contradictory things. We need to do a better job of phenotyping is the bottom line. If you don't look for something, it won't turn out to be an important factor in predicting risk or predicting mortality. So Professor Sargent, thank you for letting me use this figure. Um, the reason I like this figure is because if you look down at the bottom, um, this is um, the causes of death based on the age at which the person died. And it's pretty much intuitive that the younger patients die of infection, sepsis, acute chest syndrome. Older people, older in this case, meaning 30s and 40s, unfortunately, are dying of heart failure, renal failure, and sudden death. So why do people get these cardiovascular complications when they have sickle cell disease? Well, a lot of this was covered yesterday, but just to make a few additional points. So in terms of structural changes in the heart, there are certain physiologic ad adaptations which are expected when someone has chronic anemia. Uh, there is peripheral vasodilation in order to get more blood to the tissues. Blood pressure drops, and because of that, you activate the renin-angiotensin system. The kidneys hold on to more fluid, and so you have a volume overload state. And what happens in that situation is that the cardiac output has to increase to get more blood to the tissues again. The cardiac output increases by increasing the stroke volume, not so much the heart rate going up. And with both of these things going on, the heart starts to dilate because it's a volume overload state. The heart's working harder. And it di in fact, all four chambers of the heart dilate. And what happens is when the heart dilates, it's like a big balloon. So it gets bigger, and the wall stress increases. And in order to compensate for that, the walls have to thicken. So what you're getting is development of left ventricular hypertrophy in order to compensate for that increased wall stress. So you have dilated chambers, you have left ventricular hypertrophy, and those are expected things. But in people who have sickle cell anemia, it's not just anemia, obviously. You have the hemolysis, you have the repeated uh, vasoocclusion, you have ischemia reperfusion going on. And the main problem that this gets to in the heart is you have myocardial microvascular dysfunction. It also affects the kidneys and you, you have hypertension. But 
All of these things together lead to what in this nice figure is called maladaptive cardiovascular remodeling. Uh-oh. There we go. Okay, so, um, so that's really the problem is that's what leads to high output heart failure. And so what I'm going to do is spend a little more time on that portion there in the heart, lungs, and the periphery. So what are the vascular complications in the heart and how should we screen for them? Well, we think about things in terms of structure and function um, in cardiology for, for uh, these kinds of issues. And so what I want to try to describe to you is what we call a rheologic cardiomyopathy. That's what a lot of imaging people are starting to call the effects on the heart based on thalassemia or sickle cell disease, so any hemoglobinopathy. Um, in the general population, if you look at this um, schematic of a normal heart, people get dilated cardiomyopathies. They have weak hearts. They have LV dysfunction. They can get a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. These are mostly genetic. Or you can have a restrictive cardiomyopathy, things like amyloid infiltrative problems. Sickle cell and other hematologic problems don't really fit into any of these nice categories. And so that's the reason for this um, name, the rheologic cardiomyopathy, means that you have dilated chambers and you have hypertrophy. So it's some combination of all of these things, maybe even some component of the restrictive, as I'll tell you in a, in a couple minutes here. So how do, how do you find these problems? And this is a very simple tool. Um, it's kind of silly for a cardiologist to be showing an EKG because you all know what this is. But you know, in our institution, when we started to, Swile was interested in, in looking at some genetic associations, we started to look at our patients that had had EKGs. And only about half of them were getting this test for whatever reason. So we think we do every test on everybody. Not true. <laughs> But when do you need to do this test and why? So uh, even in this simple ECG, you can tell um, that there is poor R-wave progression. There is voltage consistent with left ventricular hypertrophy, um, which is a simple thing that you can pick up in your patients. And you can also measure intervals. And why is that important? Well, we know that one of these intervals, the QT interval, um, is associated with an increased risk of arrhythmias and sudden death. So in this study from Chicago, they looked, at, um, they looked at two different groups of patients. The first cohort, they just looked at EKGs in steady state patients, really didn't find much, um, they didn't really find it useful. In the second cohort, these were EKGs done at various times. So people could be inpatients, outpatients, they could be at steady state, they could be in crisis. And they did see some correlation between QTC and survival. The thing to remember, though, is that um, most of the time we do EKGs, trying to get to my next section here, there. Most of the EKGs are done when patients are in the hospital, though. And at that point in time, there are so many confounding variables. So people are on antibiotics, narcotics. There are electrolyte abnormalities. So is it these things that are predicting the risk? Or is it, you know, it's, you can't tease out what's causing what. But this, suffice it to say that the QTC can help you just pick up which patients are in trouble. If I point over here, that'll help. Uh, so this is a very old study. I really didn't want to show it to you, but I couldn't find anything else. And the point of this is it's that when you hospitalize patients for pain crisis, there is a really big burden of arrhythmias, at least according to experts and, and, and this one report from the 1980s. Um, in people who were hospitalized, they did Holter monitors and found about 80% of them had atrial and ventricular arrhythmia. So maybe there's a lot that we're not seeing. We need to maybe put people on monitors if they're having symptoms like palpitations or if they have electrolyte abnormalities. Maybe we need to be looking more closely for arrhythmias. So those were some of the structural electrical problems. What about down to the microvascular level? So. The coronary arteries that you see here, um, we think about a lot. You guys don't think about much in sickle cell patients because they're not really a problem. And where the problem gets down to is when the coronaries branch out into these tiny little vessels that supply the myocardium itself. Now, I already told you that the walls get thicker, and, and there's an increased oxygen demand in left ventricular hypertrophy. So combine that with the ischemia reperfusion, and that's a great setup for a supply-demand mismatch. And that is why people get ischemia, infarct, and fibrosis, which is really hard to see unless you have specific testing. Um, if you want to measure blood flow at the microvascular level, Unless you have a PET scan or an MRI, it's hard to do. But this study used MRI from Chicago. And they did see that um, you measured myocardial perfusion in these very dilated hearts with a lot of hypertrophy. 
Um, there was significantly lower perfusion in the myocardial of microvasculature in sickle cell patients compared to controls. The other thing they looked at is iron burden, which is really not a problem in most of your sickle cell patients. The other interesting finding is that they used something called late gadolinium hyperenhancement, and they did see focal areas of fibrosis in some of these patients as well. So I mentioned myocardial infarction. It doesn't happen because of large vessel coronary artery disease, but people do get infarctions and ischemia. And I think you can see that in this heart with ultrasound, with echocardiogram, uh, the walls are very thick. Uh, this is a short axis view. You can see how thick the walls are there. And in the basal septum there, there's a little bite there. The basal infralateral is akinetic. Um, and I think you can see those are areas of infarction. Um, but those are easily seen, um, at least when they're obvious on echocardiogram. So that's another way that you can pick up this kind of a problem. Uh, these are nice uh, uh, MRI images uh, bar loaned to me by a colleague. And um, I think that you can see in this particular patient, if you look at the basal infralateral wall, it thickens a, a little bit better than the rest of it. Uh, same thing here, inferior wall thickens a little better at the base than further down. And why did we even do this expensive test on a sickle cell patient, first of all? Well, there was a reason. Um, this, per this person presented with chest pain. I think it was during an acute chest crisis, and the troponins were high. And so there was a question of you know, what was causing the troponin release. And it could have been right ventricular um, etiology. It could have been a left ventricular etiology. So we realized that this person, he did have a non-ST elevation MI at the time of the acute chest episode. With this MRI, I mentioned late gadolinium uh, hyperenhancement, and without going into too much detail, basically this contrast agent goes out into the interstitium in the extravascular space. It clears away within a few minutes um, in normal tissue, so that if you image 15, 20 minutes later, areas that are abnormal because of tissue damage or fibrosis, you'll see the contrast is still there. And so if you can see, instead of nice black myocardium, you can see these white areas. Those are areas of focal fibrosis from tissue damage. So that's something you can pick up with cardiac MRI. Finally, with MRI, um, so this, um, I mentioned the extracellular space. Well, that's um, the extracellular volume fraction can be calculated by the MRI. And in a normal person, if you look at the, the blue, that's what um, the myocardial walls should look like. And when this fraction gets higher, um, in someone with, um, for example, an infarction right here, you see that this whole inferior part of the myocardium is not blue, it's abnormal. And in someone um, with a speckled pattern, that's diffuse fibrosis. Well, why am I showing you all of this? So I'm trying to show you work out of Cincinnati. Here we go. So work out of Punam's group in Cincinnati, they, um, they, they were able to do cardiac MRIs in 20 or 30 um, sequential patients. And, and if you look at that ECV, that extracellular volume fraction, it's hard to say, um, that I mentioned, controls are down here about 25%. Someone who's had an infarction, it's up to about 40, 50%. In amyloid, it'd be 50, 60%. Sickle cell patients surprisingly were high, and they found this abnormality in all of their patients, suggesting that they have diffuse fibrosis. Now, if you don't have an expensive MRI test, as I mentioned, ECHO is also very good for assessing cardiomyopathy, diastolic dysfunction, which I'm going to get into, and TR velocity. Uh, we can do measurements of volumes, ejection fraction, atrial size, um, diastolic parameters. This is a mitral inflow, tissue Doppler. This E to E prime ratio is used to predict filling pressures and tell us about diastolic function. And I'll tell you a little bit more about TR, velocity, tricuspid regurg velocity, which we use to estimate pulmonary pressures. So diastolic function, first of all, is seen in both children and adults. It's a marker of a high-risk patient. The difficulty is that you almost need to have an echo specialist to help you, and even we don't have a good definition for diastolic dysfunction in sickle cell patients. The reason being that this is from our echo guidelines. It's a little small, but the, the three or four criteria that we use to diagnose diastolic dysfunction and to grade it, 
Well, there are a lot of confounding issues in sickle cell patients, so we use TR velocity. And I'm going to tell you that there are other reasons besides diastolic dysfunction for a high TR velocity. We use left atrial size. In the general population, Poonam was asking me this yesterday, so in the general population, left atrial volume is a great marker of diastolic dysfunction in your hypertensive patients, for example. In sickle cell, it's a little bit mixed, so it seems to be better in kids. Some studies say that it is good in adults. Some studies say it's not so good in adults. And the problem is that all chambers are dilated. So if the left atrium is dilated, maybe it doesn't mean much. Maybe it does. Um, the other things that we use, the, um, the Doppler mitral inflow and tissue Doppler are a little more valuable. So I put this in just because Matt um, spoke about transplant yesterday. I told you all the bad news that can happen to the heart. Well, the good news is that some of it is reversible. So um, this is in Matt and John's um, transplant patients. We measured left ventricular size, volumes, ejection fraction, atrial size, filling pressures, and then BNP and six-minute walk distance. Green are the successful transplants. Red are the unsuccessful, but still followed very closely, so they also got a little bit better. And this is percent change. So left ventricular size, function, size got better. Function stayed about the same or got a little lower, but still in the normal range. Um, atrial size got better. Filling pressures got better. BNP, which is a peptide released when the heart is stretched, that also decreased. And six-minute walk distance got better. So that's the good news. Most of these findings um, are reversible. The problem is that in about a third of the patients, even with the best treatment, they still had a dilated heart. So there is some degree of irreversible damage that if we don't catch people early enough, we're not going to be able to reverse that. So. Um, and make this run. So what if you don't have these expensive tools or, or even not so expensive tools? What if you want to just take something to a clinic that's in a remote part of town or something? Um, Echo people love to talk about technology, so I wanted to show you these are um, portable ways that you can do an ECG. Um, so it, that's basically an iPhone size, and a patient can put their fingers on this um, little attachment. And you can get a single lead. You can also get multiple leads to tell you a little bit about um, the cardiac rhythm. This I mentioned to you yesterday. There's a handheld echo machine, which um, technology is getting better and better every year. I'm not trying to promote any sort of vendor, but there are a couple of um, companies that make this type of a machine. You can get good pictures of the heart, the size, the function. You can get color, Doppler information about the valvular disease. We don't yet have uh, TR measurements and diastolic measurements. They're coming. but. Um, on these small handheld machines. Now, there are laptop sized machines that can do the same thing. So, if you really want to assess cardiac problems in your patients, there are many different ways to go about doing that. So, uh, I'm going to mention just a little bit about vascular complications in the lung that Parker um, didn't touch upon. And you've heard a lot about TR velocity. So, um, this is a good diagram because pulmonary hypertension experts think in terms of pulmonary arterial hypertension, venous hypertension, and then uh, chronic lung disease and its effects, including thromboembolism, on, on the capillary level. Um, TR velocity is an assessment of pulmonary pressures. And not only is it pulmonary pressures, but it looks at the effects of the right heart. Uh, sorry. So it looks at the effects on the right heart, whatever's happening in the lung, so the in-between area, and what's happening in the heart. So it's an amalgamation of all of those problems, and that's why I think it's turned out to be a kind of a powerful risk marker. So I'm not going to get into whether it predicts pulmonary hypertension. These are all definitions that we can talk about later. But it's a very powerful risk marker, I think, because it incorporates all of those different problems. So two big organ systems in the heart, you can detect problems with the TR velocity. And I think that's why it's been useful. This is a nice study out of Sao Paulo. And basically what it tells us, it's a histopathology study from autopsies. And it's showing us that. Um, you do get arterial problems, you do get thromboembolic problems, and you do get problems in the venous side. So basically, the whole arterial tree is affected. And when you look, I know you can't see this, but it's about 30 or so patients, and it talks about the uh, cause of death. And so all up and down this list, either dilated cardiomyopathy or core pulmonale comes up in, I would say, a good 80% of patients. So the vast majority are developing cardiac problems. <laughs> 
So how common are these problems as best as we can tell? Well, I talked about using uh, tricuspid regurgitation measurements. If you use a higher threshold than the 2.5 that's been discussed, if you use 3.0, you pick up you pick this up in about 10% of patients, and that is a pretty high hazard ratio for mortality. If you use the NT Pro B and P um, uh, uh, blood test, you do get um, you do get this level. If you pick the threshold of 160, which many studies have done, it's in about a quarter of patients. The hazard ratio is high as well. If you happen to be able to get both of these, it's a very high hazard ratio in a small percentage of patients. So those are useful, non-invasive ways to detect which patients are going to get into trouble. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip past this. Suffice it to say that we really don't have these answers. There hasn't been any success with um, treating the pulmonary hypertension itself. Thank you. And so I'm going to talk about the periphery just because this is actually pretty important for even the, the general people who are treating um, sickle cell patients on a day-to-day -day basis. So I talked about microvascular abnormalities and, and how they affect the blood flow. And, the important thing here is that those uh, effects in the in the microcirculatory level do extend back to the larger vessels. And so you've heard about people saying they have endothelial dysfunction, biflow-mediated dilation, um, our patients have increased arterial stiffness. And uh, if you look at the arterial waveform, this is in normal people. If you look at the black, these are younger people. As we get older, the impulse has increased um, there's a higher peak there, increased amplitude. And the reason is that vessels in everybody get stiffer as we get older. So what does this have to do with sickle cell patients? Well, I, we mentioned that the blood pressure is lower in sickle cell patients, lower compared to age, sex, and race-matched controls. Um, but what happens is they, they do get a vasculopathy and they do get organ dysfunction at what we think of as normal blood pressures, and there is a higher incidence of stroke, supposedly, in, in some of the literature. And so why is that? Wow, that really changed around my slides. But um, let me just describe it to you. So in this study, um, about half of the patients had a normal blood pressure. About 43% had what's now called pre-hypertension, and the diagnosis of hypertension, 140 over 90, was present in about 10% of patients in general. Um, and if you look at how that associates with renal dysfunction and with TR velocities, there's a close correlation. So the higher the blood pressure, the higher TR, um, the higher creatinine level. This is a study out of Ghana showing you that um, overall, 19% of patients had hypertension. But look at the age difference here. If you, get, if you get to see patients in their 30s, 40s, 50s, the older they are, they're more likely to have systemic hypertension. That needs to be uh, addressed. And I would be remiss if I didn't remind you of other cardiovascular problems in older patients. And so uh, this is just to tell you how sick these patients were. So um, Hypertension was present in almost 40% of these patients. Obesity in about 20%. And Monica, we were talking about diabetes. You don't see that very often. LDL increases, you don't see that very often. So we'll skip over this, but there are some recommendations specific to sickle cell and from the UK standards. Uh, and my last important point here is that if you look at end organ damage, um, it's kind of intuitive that the more end organ damage you have, the higher risk patient you have. In this particular study, they looked at lung, kidney, and TR as a measure of whether you had one, two, or three organ damage. And you can see the prevalence there um, in terms of how many patients had what. But after eight, nine years of follow-up, look at the mortality rates. It makes a lot of sense that the more organs that are involved, the higher your mortality. So if you could do a better job of assessing organs that really um, are important. Everybody thinks that their own organ is important. Well, the heart is really important. So if you could do a better <laughs> job of looking at it, perhaps you could you know, predict much better which patients are in trouble. So finally, I'm trying to talk fast again to <laughs> save time. So take home messages. In my opinion, most adult sickle cell patients develop a rheologic cardiomyopathy. Both the US and the UK guidelines suggest a baseline echo in every adult sickle cell patient. TR velocity measurements are powerful harbingers of risk, but they're only a fraction of the data that you can get on the cardiac, the right heart, and the left heart aspects of your patients. Smaller efficient screening tools are available for low resource, set, low resource settings, so um, those are worth exploring. 
Hypertension screening should be done at every medical encounter. And end organ disease in the heart, lung, and kidneys is tightly linked and contributes to mortality. Thank you. For practical purposes, mm -hmm. and because we have these queries, what do we do with, a, with our patient population? Number one, when is a good time to do a screening echo? And I know there is no evidence, but what do you recommend uh, for re-echo? Five years, 10 years? Yeah. So quick answer is that um, I agree with the baseline echo in every adult patient. Mm -hmm. And then how often to get them I don't have a good recommendation, yeah. but I would use the same answer that Parker said, because I do have a very low threshold for recommending assessment. Anybody with dyspnea, anybody with chest pain, any, even though yeah. your patients have a lot of chest pain, but yeah. anybody with palpitations. Right. Uh, we say in valve disease patients that your patient's not asymptomatic until you've put them on a treadmill or actually tested whether they have symptoms. So just have a low threshold for looking for problems. Yeah. So, so we, I think we try that at 18, as a stepping into adulthood, we try to do one. But for routine, so definitely for patients who are clinically symptomatic, then we have a very low threshold for it, but okay. Uh, the second thing, um, hypertension. I suspect all the studies use the regular cutoffs so far. I know, and this is all anecdotal, but with a large patient population, when in my SS patients, we have 120, 80, a lot is occurring already with their kidneys and all the stuff. So I suspect we need to have lower threshold definition for yeah. hypertension. Yeah, so I think the relative systemic hypertension that a few studies have looked at aligns with what um, we call pre-hypertension for everybody else. Having said that, there are no good, there, we don't have studies on what the treatment targets should be, and we have to be careful in being very aggressive because, as we learned from treating older people, if you're too aggressive in certain populations, it doesn't help them. And so, um, I, I think in general, the standard, you know, markers of 140 over 90 should be treated. I think in our uh, renal lecture, maybe we'll hear a little bit more about being aggressive when people have proteinuria or they have defined um, renal dysfunction. But, um, other than that, I think that's a big gap area. We need studies to tell us how aggressively to treat blood pressure in these patients. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, you got to move on. In fact, I already got a big reminder that uh, ready for the next uh, talk. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce Katharina um, Miniti, who is a hematologist. Uh, looking after patients with sickle cell disease. <laughs> and she has an interest in leg ulcers. So thank you very much, thank Catherine. You, thank you. I'm going to follow the advice of Professor Knight Mountain and not be hidden by the podium due to my vertical challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor um, Knight Namaden and uh, uh, Professor Thane for inviting me to this wonderful meeting. This is my first year, but I hope it's the first of many, hint. Um, so I'm going to talk about leg ulcer and sickle cell disease, and you might think, uh, you know, it does not have anything to do with our uh, previous two talks, but uh, as I'm uh, fond of saying every time I give this talk, I consider uh, leg ulcers a window into the vasculopathy of uh, sickle cell disease, and I hope by, by the end of this talk you also will understand how uh, relevant it is identifying a leg ulcer in a patient to predict a future uh, cardiovascular and vasculopathic complications. Um, so I have, uh, these are my disclosures. 
And um, so uh, briefly about uh, uh, sickle cell, uh, um, uh, leg ulcer and sickle cell disease. Uh, as you can see, they, uh, they're, uh, they're seen in about 5 to 10% patient uh, in North America, more often in Jamaica, where I know there are uh, many more than 10%. And this is due to the seminal work of Dr. Graham Sargent, who has really published a tremendous amount of important data in this field, and in Brazil, and of course in Africa. The true incidence and prevalence is really not known. We have no registry. I can only tell you that in Bethesda cohort, when I was at NIH, we looked at 505 patients and asked this question, do you have or have you ever had a leg ulcer? And much to my surprise, 18% of all patients with sickle cell disease said yes. And that was many, you know, a few years ago. But I did the same thing at Montefiore, where currently I am, and I asked my 760 patients if they had or had an actual active ulcer, ever had an ulcer, and the number was the same, 19%. So even though when I ask my colleagues, my hematologists, do you have patients with leg ulcer, they say, nee, I don't. When you ask the patient, you get a very uh, different answers, and, and, and uh, this, uh, um, I think, is an, is an important distinction. So in general, these ulcers appear when the patients are in their teens. Um, in fact, I've had very heartbreaking histories of I mean, stories from my patients of not being able to go to prom um, because of a leg ulcer. Um, and I always ask this question, when did you get your first ulcer? They heal a lot slower than regular venous uh, um, stasis ulcer. The recurrence rate is extremely high, 49 to 90%. The etiology is not well-defined. That's what I'm trying to work on. There is no specific treatment options available, and the standard of care is not uh, uh, well-defined. So as you can see, I have my, uh, my work cut out for me. In general, they, they are um, in the, around the ankles, as you well know, but I have seen now on the dorsal some of the feet and on the, uh, the feet and on in the digit. They're very superficial in general, and even not that big, but some of them can be circumferential. What really is striking is how painful they are. The ulcer and sickle cell disease are extremely excruciating and painful. And interesting, the pain often precedes the appearance of an ulcer, and a little bit more about that. There is always evidence of venostasis. They are bilateral in about 50% of the case. They recur a lot. And they have this uh, um, ankylo. Uh oh, I knew I was doing the same thing. They have this uh, mal this abnormal is called ankle ankylosis that I had never seen before. And these are due to the chronic inflammation around the ulcer in the ankles. And so that the patient, they lose the ability to use the fulcrum of the foot. And I have seen many unfortunate patients, some from Jamaica, in fact, that came in a wheelchair, and I still remember her very well. And she uh, was not having a stroke or anything. She just couldn't walk because her feet were so ankylosed. So this is something that I think it's very important to re um, recognize early so that with physical therapy and prevention, we can avoid these uh, um, uh, very disabling um, abnormalities. I have, uh, I'm trying to classify this also. And in my career, I've seen a lot of ulcers. And I've seen different subtypes. So there are some patients that only get one ulcer. You know, when they're young, they get one ulcer. It's about 25% of all the patients that uh, answer that question, have you ever had an ulcer? And that goes away and sometimes recurs when they have intense stress. And uh, it's uh, you know something that most the hematologists don't even know the patient had unless they actually look at the ankle and they can see the scars. Then there is the a very common the stuttering ulcers, almost like stuttering priapism, you know, in which the patients continue to have this ulcer every about six to twelve months, and uh, um, they know when they are coming, and we try to intervene quickly to reduce uh, um, uh, you know uh, their uh, um, period of. Of a recurrence. And then the long standing ulcers. These are the ones that most hematologists think about when I ask them, Do you have a patient with a log ulcer? They're thinking about the chronic, very large circumferential ulcer that are associated with severe morbidity and, mor and, and mortality. <laughs> 
And uh, um, this is a, 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 a proposal cell uh, staging that we have uh, developed in at uh, Montefiore with our wound doctor. This is an actual an actual patient. And uh, what do we notice sequential in this patient is that there is an early an early stage, stage one here, in which the patient complains of pain and itching, and you don't really see an ulcer. You see there is no ulcer margin. Uh, there is, uh, um, you know, it's difficult to identify. You just have to believe the patient that an ulcer is coming. And then some of them progress to the stage two, in which there is pain and burning, lots of burning, and the skin becomes to be necrotic and has these edges and the margin. Now, once the patient gets to the stage two, it always gets to stage three. There is nothing you can do because the necrosis, the ischemia has already occurred. So um, don't get discouraged, I'm telling you know the patients and, uh, and the doctors, if you cannot do anything between stage and three because it's, the damage has already happened. And that is important because wound doctors tend to change treatment every five seconds. So the last thing that happens, and oh, let's try this new thing. And that's what they do. These are the famous NIHBI uh, gui guidelines that have been mentioned by many uh, before me. And the reason why I put them here is because, unfortunately, as you can see, for the very few lines and the little amount of writing underneath, there isn't much in this guideline. They basically say to just ask the patient if they have an ulcer, and they say to look for osteomyelitis. Absolutely don't do that. And uh, actually, my experience of very few patients have osteomyelitis. And I always say this, that when we have a patient admitted who has a leg ulcer, they always send them down to MRI looking for osteomyelitis, which is invariably negative. The only thing it does, the patient will leave with a pain score of two and come back with a pain score of 10 because they've been sitting in the cold MRI room for absolutely no reason. In my experience, I've seen two or three patients with osteomyelitis. So um, if you treat patients, even if you're not a hematologist, do not order this MRI. Uh, it really doesn't help much. Um, OK. And uh, uh, I am going to um, proceed to um, show you how um, there are only two prognostic factors that tell me which patient is going to heal. And this is my own data, but it has been reproduced by Patricia Senet in France. And this is absolutely the same data. And basically, what this shows is that age of presentation and size are the two important predictors of uh, uh, healing potential. And the two numbers you have to remember is that age of presentation less than 90 days and a size that is more than 10 square centimeters. And Patricia Senet in her cohort in France had almost the same data, which I was very shocked. It was 60 days and 9 square centimeters. So I think this must be uh, correct. And uh, let's see. Yes, so these were my recommendation. And by the way, what you can see here at the end, at the bottom, I recently developed a, a little step-by-step -step protocol for wound care, um, at care. I'm talking about the wound, not the patient. And so if you want to see my little protocol for uh, treating sickle cell ulcer, just send me an email, and I'll send you the protocol. It's about two pages and tells you what to do what I think we should do. And uh, so this is my recommendation. First of all, inspect the lower extremities during physical examination for active or healed ulcers. Optimize sickle cell care. That's the most important thing. So treat the patient, not just the ulcer. So I, I continue hydroxyurea. I have more about hydroxyurea. I might start the glutamine. I think amino acid is very important. Nutrition is very important. I always do a thorough evaluation for occult renal disease, tear jet velocity, DVT, retinopathy, and AVN. And why? Because I do think that the leg ulcer, I mean, all I do think, I do know that patients with leg ulcer are enriched for cardiovascular complications.
and sometimes people are not looking for them. I refer to a wound care specialist immediately because as I said, the sooner you see the wound specialist, the better it is for your outcome. And then uh, I, um, uh, you know, I only evaluate re rarely for osteomyelitis for when I really think there is an infection. I limit the use of, of antibiotics very much, avoid hyperbaric, it never works, I'm very skeptical of grafts, they always recur, and consult the PT to avoid these ankle deformities, consult a nutritionist, and really talk to your social worker. Pain, two seconds about pain. Pain in sickle cell ulcer is, as I said, excruciating. It happens before the ulcers appear. I think it's the ischemia. It does not correlate to ulcer size. Nothing to do. It can be a pin, a teeny tiny ulcer, and the pain is nine or 10, especially at night. It does not let them sleep and so on. The pain decreases as the ulcer becomes more chronic, and then you have neuropathy that ensues. So when I have a patient with leg ulcer, I use more gabapentin and Lyrica than opioids. Opioids don't work very much, even though most of my patients are on um, opioids. And um, the, some data that we published with Matt Shea at NIH shows, as we expected, that sickle cell leg ulcer negatively impact, you know, uh, a mental and physical health um, health uh, um, uh, scores, and especially in the young people. It seems that uh, the younger patients with ulcer are much more alienated from their peers, have increased psychological stress and lower self-esteem and depression. It seems that the older ones are a little bit more adapted to having a, um, an, an ulcer. So to conclude this part of the treatment of the patient with sickle cell and leg ulcer has to be systemic, has to be physical, psychological, and nutritional. I saw that there is a, a UVEN, which is a nutritional supplement that is being uh, promoted here. And I have to say, I have used it in some patients with leg ulcer, and I, and I think there were some positive results. In the wound uh, um, world, when I go to those lectures, nutrition is one of the most important aspects of uh, um, healing in a leg ulcer. So two words about the hydroxyl leg ulcer, because I always get this question. So there is the data that uh, patients that have other type of uh, uh, hematological uh, um, diseases and myeloprofility disorders have leg ulcer. There is data in patients with sickle cell that have a leg ulcer. And so hydroxyl is often stopped as soon as they have a leg ulcer. Now, I think I, I would say not so fast. So because hydroxyurea, and I know Russell you know, is in the audience, and they will appreciate, there are many potential benefits of hydroxyurea leg ulcer. It decreases the white count, decreases the cytokines, it decreases inflammation, increases hemoglobin, hemoglobin F, decreases hemolysis, increases oxygen capacity, improves RBC rheology, is a nitric oxide donor, as uh, this uh, graph on the right shows. This is from my phase one study, in which due to the fact that we have fantastic uh, you know, uh, uh, pharmacists here, they did pharmacokinetics of, um, a sodium, of a nitrite in the blood, and they showed that patients that were taking hydroxyurea, which were on the trial, they were having an increased release of nitrite in the blood, which dose depended. So it was a little bit for the 500, a little bit more for 1,000 milligrams, and more for the 1,500. So basically, hydroxyurea is a nitric oxide donor. What I think what happens with hydroxyurea is that, uh, um, and, and this has been shown in other disorders, is that there are conditions that, that have already a hyperviscosity, like polycythemia vera. They, uh, they are the ones that then, when you add the hydroxyurea, are at risk of developing leg ulcer. So I think hydroxyurea just uh, acts on a, an environment that is already damaged. It's not the hydroxyurea in itself that uh, causes the leg ulcer. And I did a little um, analysis of my own data, also looking at hemoglobin F and uh, um, leg ulcer. And even though this is small, I can just tell you that in patients on hydroxyurea with or without, uh, uh, with or without leg ulcer, the amount of hemoglobin F, unfortunately, did not seem to be different. So unfortunately, in my hands, I have to 
to say that hemoglobin F has never been um, that uh, protective against uh, hydroxyurea. I'm going to skip this uh, because I want to go to the uh, uh, more um, new stuff about uh, these uh, lectures. And of course, I'm going to promote my clinical trial. So I have a phase two clinical trial in which I look at topical sodium nitrite in a patient with sickle cell disease. The phase one was completed at NIH. It was very promising. We um, had um, 18 subjects with uh, those escalating um, sodium nitrite. So this is the clinical trial that is currently open. And we actually had a patient from Jamaica come in the enroll in the study, I have to say. And she did the, quite well. And um, these are the inclusion exclusion criteria. Basically, it's everybody that has an ulcer that is not the circumferential type. It's very difficult to put the cream when you have such a long, uh, large ulcer. Most important, they have a pretreatment phase, basically for two weeks or minimum. I see the patients as standard of care. And basically, if they decrease by 25% before they get to cream application, they are off the study. Because what I've noticed is that with good wound care, many patients actually have a decrease in the wound. And so I want to make sure it's the sodium nitrite and not just the wound care that improves the size of the ulcer. And then I follow them for two and a half years because I know how important it is to follow up patients because the ulcer tend to recur. So just curing an ulcer now doesn't mean that the patient is ulcer free. And uh, um, these are the specific aims. And this is what we have learned. And we have a, an abstract at ASH that, that uh, talks about the, the challenges in recruiting patients for a rare complication of a rare disease. And uh, so basically, I have screened 79 subjects that I knew they had a, a leg ulcer. Actually, now 98. This is when I sent the abstract. And uh, um, many of them didn't have an active ulcer. So we only had 43 with active wound. 34 were eligible. Because a G6PD deficiency is an exclusion criteria, because we give sodium nitride, one of the potential effects is increasing methemoglobin. And you have to give methylene blue if you get high met methemoglobin. And if you have G6PD deficiency, I cannot give uh, um, methemoglobin. I mean, it's a long explanation why that is an exclusion criteria. Anyway, at the end of the day, I only have. 15 enrolled, and uh, three experienced an ulcer decrease of more than 25% and were off the study. So it does happen with good care, they do improve. These are the enrollees today. As you can see, the uh, um, you know they're mostly SS and S beta zero, and uh, about half of them have more than uh, one ulcer. And the surface area is not that big; it's between you know one and twenty-one square centimeters. And these are just added last night because I asked her to look at my red cap, and I just want you know from one of my CRA, and I wanted just to show that this uh, population is pre is very heavily pretreated. Look how many wound therapies they have had before. This is the number of wound therapies that each patient has had. So they have they are heavily, heavily pretreated. They are most of them are on a chronic opioid. This is their um, uh, pain level. And the current use of hydroxyurea, um, it's about uh, you know um, three fourths are not, and one are on hydroxyurea. And then I ask this question here: Did you have the leg ulcer before your first ulcer? Only one patient had an ulcer. Uh, um, I mean, add an ulcer um, after they started the hydroxyurea. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that before the first ulcer, they were not on hydroxyurea. So it's not that the hydroxyurea was causing the ulcer. They had the ulcer before hydroxyurea was even started. And so I use this to support the idea not to stop the hydroxyurea in patients with uh, uh, sickle cell disease and leg ulcer. There are many studies that we are doing, and one of them that I'm doing in collaboration with an HGRI, which is called Insights, and which is really to have insights in how genomic, microbial, physical, and social factor influence leg ulcers. And this is the conceptual framework of how leg ulcers are um, in the middle. And they are influenced by uh, many factors, psychosocial, environmental, omics, and stress that uh, um, really affects leg ulcer um, um, a lot. And uh, through this collaboration, we have uh, published some data on the thromboinflammation in sickle cell disease, uh, which was presented last year at ASH, immune modulation, psychosocial infected stigma. In fact, the title 
title of this uh, talk, uh, of this paper, is uh, I don't want you to know my uh, little secret. Adrenaline insufficient, and now we're working on transcriptome and whole exam, um, exam uh, um, analysis. I wanted to um, show this uh, since I see the five minutes. Uh, this is an AMSO that has been presented as we speak at ASCAT. You have heard about the GBT44 or now Voxelotor um, during this conference. And as part of the HOPE study, 13 patients uh, were, um, uh, had a leg ulcer before starting the study. And uh, um, three um, uh, were on placebo, six were on Voxelator 900, then four on Voxelator 1500 here. And uh, um, after 24 weeks, three of the four patients in the Voxelator 1500 healed. One improved, no new leg ulcer. In the 900, five of six improved, but two patients developed new ulcer, and the placebo, none of them improved. And this is in a graphic way. You can see the Voxelator 1500, Voxelator 900, and placebo. So this was just a signal that uh, maybe Voxelator uh, um, can have an effect in patients uh, with the sickle cell disease and leg ulcer. And so I'm asking GBT now to look uh, uh, in their expanded access at patients with leg ulcer and see if they get better. And this is another clinical trial that uh, uh, we are collaborating with, and it's a pilot study of deferoxamis intradermal delivery uh, patch. This is basically an iron chelator. This is work that originates from Stanford and, uh, and uh, that uh, um, has shown in a mouse model that uh, the sickle cell, which I worked with Dr. Kalpna Gupta, that uh, deferoxamine actually helps healing, and probably because it reduces the oxidative stress because it's a chelator. But this is what I really want to say at the end of this talk. As I've been thinking about how to analyze leg ulcer, it's clear to me that healing is not the right endpoint. So now I think a leg ulcer as a VOC of the skin. What I mean is that they, this is a recurrent vasoclusive event. So the leg ulcers. Um, what we need to do with leg ulcer is trying to decrease their recurrence. So I am looking at days with leg ulcers versus days without leg ulcers. I wouldn't tell a patient who has VOCs, oh, I'm going to stop all of your VOCs. And the same thing is with leg ulcer. I cannot say, I'm going to cure this ulcer forever. I think what I'm going to say now is I'm going to decrease the number of days you have a leg ulcer, and I'm going to try to decrease the recurrence time, you know, the time to second ulcer, the time to first ulcer, and most important, improve quality of life and pain. And uh, so this is uh, the scheme, the mechanism that you have seen now in sickle cell over and over again, this vicious circle of all the complication of a sickle cell disease. And uh, uh, we always have a big team uh, behind us that helps us, uh, has come to this meeting so that they can take care of the patients when we are here. And I need to thank them all. And uh, uh, with this, I thank again for your attention. And hopefully, we have time for one or two questions. I think in New York very well. <laughs> New, York New York is my place. place. That's right. Yes, she has a question. Question. I think you can hear me, because it's not a question. I just want to, well, I'll do it here for the live stream. Um, I just want to thank you. I'm a patient advocate in Los Angeles, and we have what is supposed to be a sickle cell clinic. We, we took, took one, one of our patients who suffered from leg ulcers to the clinic. Whether they didn't care, didn't know, I don't know. I just know that the end, the, the end of the conversation was, we don't think this is a good fit for our clinic. That lady died about a month later. Well, so I, I, I'm just saying for all of you who are there saying, oh yeah, that's interesting. It has to be more than that's interesting. If you're not sure exactly of everything that Dr. Benetti just said, I'm sure she will take an email from you because we can't let this continue to happen where 
somebody somewhere knows how to solve these problems and the people who are being presented with the problems don't ask the right questions. Right. Well, thank so. you for asking this question because actually there is ample data that shows that patients with leg ulcer are the ones that develop pulmonary hypertension, they develop renal diseases. So the leg ulcer in itself is no one is gonna kill the patients, but the leg ulcer is like something in our face that tells us we have to pay attention to this patient because he or she will have cardiovascular uh, complication later on. So I'm just thanking you for paying attention. Thank you. Just one more question. Can I have a question? Um, you spoke about um, hydroxyurea. Yes. You spoke about to stop hydroxyurea. Those were there before. Um, don't know if you spoken the but I'm not um hydroxyurea is beneficial in the healing of these whole also at all. It's a very good question, and that's why in this phase two trial I'm stratifying for hydroxyurea use to see if hydroxyurea actually helps or, or does not help. Because as I the presenter yesterday that spoke about hydroxyurea, it mentioned the Help. question was, do you think, uh, do you have evidence that hydroxyurea actually helps wound healing? Uh, in, in fact, yeah, that, yeah, that's what she asked, yes. And so I think it's a very good question. It's very difficult to answer. That's why I'm trying to stratify for hydroxyurea in my phase two trial so that I can answer that very important question. But what I can tell you is that with or without hydroxyurea, the ulcer will follow its own course. I've never seen that I stop hydroxyurea, the ulcer goes away and does not come back. It might go away for that one month, but then it comes back. So you might as well take the hydroxyurea that will help you all your other organs. Exactly, exactly, thanks. Okay, we'll have to move on. And it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Claire Shaw who is a professor of renal medicine in King's College London. Claire and I used to work very closely in the past while I was in King's on renal complications. And uh, thank you very much, Claire, for making this trip to come and address us. This is not your first trip, of course. <laughs> not my first trip, no. Yeah. Thank you, Swile. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to come to this beautiful country. So as Swile says, I'm a nephrologist and I've been um, working with patients with sickle cell disease since Swile invited me to do a joint clinic in 2004. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about kidney disease. Lots of the previous speakers have mentioned it as a, a, a sort of bad thing that comes at the end. So hopefully I'll give you some ideas on how we can prevent it or lessen the impact of it. So we know that uh, sickle cell disease is a vasculopathy, it affects small blood vessels and therefore it's not surprising that the kidney is a target in sickle cell disease. As you can see from this drawing, there are lots of tiny blood vessels in the kidney. And the other curiosity about the kidneys, it has this very split blood supply. About 20% of the cardiac output goes through the kidneys even though they take up only 3% of body volume. And all of that blood has to go through the cortex in order to be filtered. But the inner part of the kidney, the medulla, um, has a blood supply that comes off the efferent arterioles. So it's the only blood supply anywhere that has uh, already been through capillary bread. So by the time the blood is going through the inner part of the kidney, it's going very slowly, it's deoxygenated, and the, the medulla of the kidney is very hypoxic, very acidotic, and the flow of blood is very slow. So it's not difficult to understand why sickling is gonna happen in the inside part of the kidney, in the medulla. And that results in, over time, a loss of those vasorecta, those blood vessels that go down into the medulla of the kidney. This is some post-mortem micropuncture data. This is what a normal kidney looks like with the glomeruli up in the cortex and the vasorecta coming down. And this is what it looks like. This is actually from a child. So it can happen very rapidly. And this is the damage that causes that hyposthenuria, that inability to concentrate urine. So, what are the clinical manifestations of, uh, of renal involvement in sickle cell disease? So, we 
We think of renal failure as a, a problem in adults, and it is a problem in adults. It's very rare for children to get renal failure. But the impact of the kidney starts very young. We know from the baby hug study that they start to have an increased GFR from as young as six to nine months old. Um, and that's due to this high cardiac output that you heard from Vedana, this high blood flow that goes through the kidney. They have an increased blood flow, increased GFR, and that gradually rises as they get a, go through childhood. And they can get to GFRs up to 200, 300 um, mils per minute. And this is the phenomenon called hyperfiltration. So what is hyperfiltration? You've heard the words, I'm sure people bandy it around all the time, but how does it actually lead to progressive chronic kidney disease? Well, we each have, when we have two healthy kidneys, we have about two million nephrons between our two kidneys. And they have to do the work of filtering this blood. So if you think about the load that they have to, uh, the, the, this big wall here is the load that they have to filter, and there's lots of nephrons that are doing that piece of work. In a hyperfiltration stage, that load is just greater. They have to work harder. And as they work harder, they begin to wear out. Some of them just get overworked and you start to lose nephrons and they'll scar. As you lose nephrons, the blood flow doesn't decrease, so those remaining nephrons have to work even harder. And so you get this vicious cycle of nephron loss and the remaining nephrons having to work even harder. And this is how hyperfiltration leads to progressive uh, kidney disease. So, Young children have high GFR. As they get older and they lose nephrons, they tend to get this decreasing GFR from about the age of 30 onwards. And this is some cross-sectional data from our patients at King's, just looking at the GFR according to age. And I think you can clearly see how it just gradually falls. This line here is at 60, so anything below 60 is a uh, proper chronic kidney disease. So you can see what percentage of patients are beginning to fall below this line, but you'll notice and there are none of them in this younger age group. It's proper kidney failure is definitely a phenotype that you only really see in adults unless there are other comorbidities. With the hyperfiltration, that increased pressure in the glomerulus just causes damage over time to the filtration barrier, and that starts to lead to proteinuria. So proteinuria is a marker that there's um, hyperfiltration has been happening. So it starts at very low levels with microalbuminuria, and over time it gets heavier and heavier to frank proteinuria. And this again is a cross-section from some of our patients at King's, just looking at the prevalence of microalbuminuria according to age. And by the time you get up to the older age groups, um, you'll see that almost 80% of patients have proteinuria. So hyperfiltration is almost ubiquitous. And that if you live long enough and you have sickle cell disease for long enough, most people eventually get that damage in the kidney as manifest by the proteinuria. This increased renal blood flow also goes to other parts of the nephron that sit in the cortex, so the proximal tubule sits in the cortex. That also has an increased renal blood flow, and that results in some secretion of creatinine into the filtrate in ways other than through filtration. So when we talk about measuring kidney function, we talk about the GFR, and we estimate that from the serum creatinine. But if creatinine is getting into the filtrate via a different route, the plasma levels of creatinine are lower than GFR, and we just have to bear that in mind. That Creatinine is not the best way to measure renal function, although it's really what we're left with. As I mentioned at the beginning, those loss of those vasorecta happens very early in childhood, and that's what leads to the inability to concentrate urine, and that's why children suffer with enuresis. There's problems in the distal convoluted duple. I don't know if you've um, picked up on this, but hyperkalemia is very common in our patients, particularly when they get unwell. So they don't excrete potassium very well in their distal convoluted tubule. Hematuria, I won't go into detail, but it's quite common. It can be caused by infarction in the papillae. Very rarely it's caused by medullary carcinoma. And something that we've discovered screening our patients at King's is simple cysts, and they are simple cysts, but they're much more common in patients with sickle cell disease than they are 
um, in age match and ethnically matched controls. So if you have a young person, as we had, who had lots of renal cysts on ultrasound, please don't tell them they've got adult polycystic kidney disease like our patient was, because they really probably don't. So what are the risk factors for progression? As you remember that graph, those people that had a GFR below 60 is only about 10 to 12 percent. If everyone has hyperfiltration, everyone eventually develops proteinuria. Why is it that only about 10 to 12 percent of them actually go on and have proper progressive chronic kidney disease with risk of needing dialysis? Well, a se severe sickle phenotype is definitely a risk factor. Frequent admissions, um, recurrent acute kidney injury, high levels of hemolysis. This is um, a patient who had multiple uh, painful crises, got acute kidney injury every time they came in. And you might think that although they had an acute kidney in injury, their creatinine returns to normal. But if you actually look slightly more closely, the GFR is declining over this time, and the degree of proteinuria is definitely going up. So recurrent episodes of AKI do um, cause progression of chronic kidney disease. This is someone who had cardiac failure, and often the, the acute kidney injury that's precipitated in cardiac failure is when their diuretics are increased. So they'll come in fluid overloaded, their diuretics will come up, they have acute kidney injury, they come into hospital, the diuretics are reduced, and they go through this vicious cycle. And underlying this, you can see a gradual decline in GFR. And as, you, as we've heard before, hemolysis, severe levels of hemolysis are associated with a severe phenotype, and that's certainly true if you look at levels of hemolysis and associate it with proteinuria. Genetic modifiers, um, we all know that it's a single SNP that causes um, uh, sickle cell disease, so what is it that makes some people worse than others? Well, we know these three common genetic modifiers, the alpha globin genotype, so if you have alpha thalassemia, that can actually be protective against hemolysis. And there are other modifiers, APOL1, haplotypes have been known to be associated with progression of chronic, chronic kidney disease in um, black African patients, and BCL11A, as we know, around fetal hemoglobin. And we can put all of these together, as has been done by this paper by Saraf, and we can use these genetic modifiers to pre predict which patients are likely to progress in their chronic kidney disease. And if you have the, uh, the risk haplotype of all of these genetic modifiers, you actually have a much higher rate of progressing in your chronic kidney disease than if you don't have them. So this is a helpful way of stratifying our patients in the clinic, who are the ones that are likely to develop progressive chronic kidney disease. And Last of all, don't forget another renal insult. We've touched a little bit on hypertension. Um, so hypertension is a really um, important risk factor, and the level of which you say someone is hypertensive is much lower in sickle cell disease. What that number is, I don't know. But whenever I treat patients, I will tend to target to at least 120 over 80. The 140 over 90 target in all the studies, that's only for people without proteinuria, and all of these patients have proteinuria. So even in the um, hypertension studies, 130 over 80 would be your target for anyone with proteinuria. But I would say in sickle cell disease, go for 120 over 80. Just to show you some examples, this is a patient who had severe hypertension, and this was the progression of her chronic kidney disease, despite everything we tried to do over a five-year period, and she ended up on hemodialysis. And this is someone with type 1 diabetes. The combination of another risk factor with sickle cell disease almost always results in a sort of rapidly progressive um, chronic kidney disease. So how do we manage it, and how do we prevent progression? We've I'm going to talk a bit, little bit about a few of these. We know about hydroxyurea, and I'll talk a little bit about that. There's such little evidence in chronic kidney disease that a lot of what I'm going to show you is um, anecdotal evidence, I'm afraid, but also what's out in the literature. I'll talk about transfusion therapy. I'll talk a little bit about ACE inhibitors and dialysis and transplantation for those patients that we can't prevent from progressing. We've been using ACE inhibitors in kidney disease for decades, and we know in diabetes that ACE inhibitors really slow the progression of chronic kidney disease. Unfortunately, there's very little evidence in sickle cell disease that they work, except we know that they work by reducing hyperfiltration in diabetic nephropathy. So there is absolutely no reason why they shouldn't work just as well in sickle cell disease, because hyperfiltration is the pathophysiology. There is one 
small study that's been done on uh, 12 patients, a randomized controlled trial. It was the only one that came out of this Cochrane review. And although this review said there's no evidence to support the use of ACE inhibitors, I really strongly recommend that you do use them because um, they do have impact. And when you look at individual patients, we can see this person who had um, declining renal function, high proteinuria, worsening creatinine. When we start on an ACE inhibitor, the creatinine stabilizes, the proteinuria comes down. And I could show you hundreds of patients, maybe not hundreds, but many patients that would fit this pattern. So hydroxyurea and exchange transfusion. Well, we know from the Hustle study that hydroxyurea can improve the hyperfiltration. It can bring that GFR down to levels where it's causing less damage. It's observational um, data, but it does uh, give us some indication that the hydroxyurea is beneficial. And also transfusion. When you compare cohorts of children that have been transfused with cohorts of children that haven't been transfused at baseline, those that have been transfused have a lower GFR than those that haven't. So there's some, some observational data that transfusion might help. I'm now going to just talk you through one of my patients because I think he illustrates quite a lot of the things that I'm talking about. I first met him in 2005. He was 43 at that time. He had a severe phenotype, creatinine of 212, which translates to 2.39. Very proteinuric. He was hypertensive. He had hip disease. He'd had pulmonary embolism. He had leg ulcer. He had multiple admissions of painful crises. And this is what had happened in the couple of years preceding to when I first met him. These were acute kidney injury episodes with frequent episodes of vasoclusion. And thankfully, at that point, Swele, I think, started him on hydroxyurea. And everything got a lot better. His painful crises um, reduced. His renal function actually even started to improve. He then was so well, he got married and decided he wanted to have a family. And so just stopped his hydroxyurea and everything got worse again. His painful crisis came back, his creatinine went up, he realized children weren't so great anyway, and he restarted his hydroxyurea. <laughs> and you can see how well he responded to it. This was his uh, HBF level, it came up straight away, as soon as it stopped, it dropped, as soon as he restarted, it came back up. So it really reflected how well he was. He then remained well on hydroxyurea for a while, but his wife got a little bit irritated. I really want to have these children. We weren't going to go through the same um, process of stopping his hydroxyurea again without doing anything else. So we did stop his hydroxyurea, but we started him on exchange transfusion. And we kept his uh, HBS below 30%. During that time, he had a hip replacement. He remained quite well. And in July 2013, they had twins. Um, but with all this transfusion for many years, there is the inevitable accumulation of iron, even when it's exchange. And since he had two in one, he thought, I really have had enough children now. So we put him back on, um, we stopped his exchange, put him back on hydroxyurea. But he'd got quite used to having a hemoglobin of around 10. And with the hydroxyurea, it dropped back down to about 70. So we started it on erythropoietin, because by this time, his renal function was really quite poor. He responded really well to the EPO, but not everyone does. And he was maintained very well um, with a hemoglobin of about 80 or 90 on EPO and a hydroxyurea. So by this stage his GFR was about 25 and he was really heading towards dialysis. It is inevitable. And we know from the data from France that the prognosis of patients when they're on dialysis is really quite poor. Um, over a five-year period they're much more likely to have infections, they have complications with their um, AV access, and they're much, much less likely to be put up for a kidney transplant. And we know from this um, the re very recent data from this French group that patients, even when they are transplanted, they tend to have poorer survival compared to patients without sickle cell disease. But if you do a um, death-censored graft survival, how well does their kidney function work, they actually do quite well if you take out patient survival from the equation. So we wanted to ask the question, can we use exchange transfusion to improve survival um, after, um, after renal transplantation? Or actually, does giving them lots of blood make it worse because of their immunization? In the world of kidney transplantation, we're always taught to avoid blood transfusion. So we've done a retrospective um, 
study of 34 patients we've transplanted across London over the last 20 years. Mean age of transplantation was 36, and about 20 of them at some point had received exchange blood transfusion. To cut a long story short, they do those that have had EBT at some point, either before or after transplant, um, they have actually better kidney function at one year and five years. And when we look at uh, the complications that might have arisen, um, not surprisingly, the recurrence of the sickle cell nephropathy, the kidney disease due to sickle cell disease, was less, much less in those patients who had had exchange transfusion. Um, Really surprisingly and uh, reassuringly, the rejection rates were actually also lower in those patients that had exchange transfusion, as was the instance of developing donor-specific antibodies. So this, was, this really reassured us that we weren't actually making it worse by giving them transfusion. And if we look at survival, this, even though it's a small number, this is uh, statistically significant. If you look at these patients who had, did not have exchange transfusion, and these are the patients that did have exchange transfusion, there's a huge impact on patient survival. And when we look at death, sen uh, death sensor graph survival, again, those with EBT have much better kidney function compared to those without EBT. So Mr. O is now 57. He has had declining GFR over the last couple of years and in October 2017 we created his first stage fistula and that then has to be transposed to make it superficial so he had his second stage fistula in January last year and he commenced hemodialysis in spring last year and he's now activated on the kidney transplant list he's back on exchange transfusion I was hoping he would have had his transplant by today but I'm afraid he hasn't quite had it yet so I can't bring that final piece of good news but hopefully by the next time I give this presentation he would have had his kidney transplant so to summarize sickle cell nephropathy it's common if you categorize it as proteinuria and raise GFR but actually end-stage kidney failure is not so common although it's getting increasingly common as our population ages moderate severe um, uh, impaired kidney function is associated as we've heard with increased mort mortality and morbidity it's associated with all the other cardiovascular complications and pulmonary complications Patients should be monitored regularly for proteinuria and, and declining kidney function, and they really should be treated with ACE inhibitors because it does prolong the life of their kidney function. And although a lot of the data is observational or anecdotal, I think there is an increasing body of evidence that hydroxyurea can preserve kidney function over time and that we should be encouraging our patients, even if we have to dose reduce it, to take this drug. And early transplantation, life on dialysis is miserable for anybody, but it's particularly miserable if you have sickle cell disease. And we really should be pushing these patients towards transplantation as quick as possible. Uh, in our unit, we put them all in exchange blood transfusion, but that is up to the individual units. And I would certainly say, try and make sure, um, don't ever send a patient in for a kidney transplant who hasn't been properly exchanged, because if you put a cold ischemic kidney into someone with a high S percent, it's obvious what's going to happen to that kidney. And in patients who haven't been exchanged prior to um, transplantation, they all have delayed graft function where it takes at least 10 days, two weeks for that kidney to start working. And that has really bad prognostic uh, indicator. So please consider exchange transfusion. It's much cheaper than dialysis. Thank you. Um, thank you, Claire. That was really fantastic. Uh, I'm a pediatric hematologist. Uh, my questions are twofold. One is if you're treating the blood pressure at a lower value, is there any concern, even though uh, agreeably it's from unhealthy blood vessels, that it might affect compensatory um, mechanisms for cerebral blood flow and oxygenation. And very quickly, my second question was uh, role of NSAIDs. We use them pretty liberally for uh, pain episodes. Thank you. Two really good questions. Um, certainly blood pressure um, 
as Vedana said, you can go too low, and everything like this is a U-shaped curve. If you go too low, you start to do damage again. From the cerebral perfusion in a young patient, they'll tell you if they feel dizzy when they stand up. So I think if someone's actually getting symptoms of postural hypotension, then you've gone too far. Um, a lot of our patients have starting blood pressures of 95 systolic and lots of proteinuria. So that's the difficult thing. It's not so much the hypertensive patient, it's the proteinuric patient that you want to give an ACE inhibitor to. And often you can only really get away with like 1.25 milligrams of ramipril or something really tiny. So it's, I tend to target the proteinuria um, really more than the blood pressure, trying to get that under control, but certainly don't go too far. The non-steroidal question is really interesting because they're hugely good painkillers, they're not opiates. Um, I know um, other nephrologists might stand up and say, avoid them, they're evil, but I, we can't say that. They're great painkillers, and if you need them, use them. They reduce the GFR, so you could even logically say, if you've got a very hyperfiltrating person, they could even be beneficial. But certainly, if someone's got a GFR below 90, I would, and um, below 60, I would really avoid them. But it, or one or two doses when someone's really unwell, you know, I think it's a pragmatic decision, but certainly avoid taking them regularly when their GFR is below 60. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, Hi, Claire. This was a very nice summary of uh, sickle nephropathy. Um, I just had a comment, uh, two comments actually. One of them was that you've attributed all of nephropathy to hyperfiltration. And I would like to add that, uh, you know, um, we've published two papers now showing there is a presence of hyperangiotensinemia in patients with sickle cell disease uh, that uh, predates all nephropathy that develops. And it's due to the high um, ROS. You know, it basically oxidizes angiotensinogen and leads to increased production of angiotensin. And that could be contributing besides hyperfiltration to sickle nephropathy. And in fact, we have also published that when patients were on hydroxyurea, uh, the hyperangiotensinemia falls significantly. And that may be a contributor to hydroxyurea improving uh, the nephropathy in patients, and especially in M Mr. O. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and the second comment I had was for the same reason, and again, um, this is something that, um, you know, I feel a little strongly about. Is there is this myth around the sickle cell world that ACE inhibitors, um, you know, based on really weak evidence. I know that they do decrease proteinuria, but there is evidence that um, and there is a reason why there is hyperangiotensinemia. And hyperangiotensinemia is actually protective in some ways because the angiotensin receptor 2 signaling is highly renoprotective. It actually has been published that, you know, animals that have angiotensin 2, so angiotensin signals through angiotensin receptor 1, which is what ARBs block, and that is the major bad cop, if you may. Uh, if there is excessive signaling through receptor 1. But the receptor 2 is actually renoprotective. And when you give ACE inhibitors, you block both receptors. When you give ARBs, you only block that receptor. So I feel that there isn't enough evidence in the sickle nephropathy literature of really having good quality data that supports ACE inhibitors. Because yes, they will reduce proteinuria, but they will really, they may be having a deteriorating effect. For instance, your patient O, Mr. O, has still a declining GFR. He doesn't know, he's on dialysis, but yeah. And has, has reached hemodialysis. Yes, you, so I just don't want okay. the... So can I, can I come back about the angiotensin? Certainly angiotensin receptor type 2 does have a very different signaling pathway to angiotensin receptor type 1, and you will block both with ACE inhibitors, and certainly in animal models I, I see some of that data. If you look at... And I'm, I'm all for big trials in sickle cell disease with ACE inhibitors. Um, I think that would be a great idea, and how early should we start them? We don't know the answer to that question. But if you look at diabetic nephropathy that has a lot of things in common, the data that um, ACE inhibitors protect against progression is so overwhelming that it's, 
in diabetic nephropathy, in proteinuric, all causes proteinuric kidney disease. So there are big trials in all causes proteinuric kidney disease from different diseases, not just diabetic, and it's protective in all of them. So on the basis of um, 50, 60,000... Superimposing 000, those diseases on sickle cell so disease. It, but the mechanism of progressive chronic kidney disease and sickle cell nephropathy isn't hugely out completely different to everything else and unless you have until we have the evidence that it is dangerous I think there's overwhelming evidence that we can extrapolate from that we should use them and it certainly does reduce the proteinuria Mr O had a GFR when I first saw him before we started dating him but it was about 30 and nephrotic range proteinuria and if you put those risk factors into a normal score you would have expected him to be on dialysis within two years and he had another 15 years off dialysis so 